Before we begin, I'd like to thank Destiny 2 Lightfall. Not for paying me anything, god no, no one's paying me, but for being such a disappointment that my Destiny addiction was temporarily cured long enough for me to make this video. I want to talk about Oblivion for a minute. Okay, yes, fine, a bit longer than a minute. But I want to preface this by saying that this is by no means meant as a definitive critique, nor am I under delusions that my nasally opinion is always correct. I want to talk about a game that I love, whose story I love significantly less, and maybe explore some elements of effective storytelling as we go. So if that sounds interesting, grab a cup of coffee or tea or whatever and let's dive in. I don't know why I'm saying that. Who am I kidding? This is probably fodder for your second monitor while you're procrastinating or playing something else, and I can respect that. We all wish my voice was more soothing, but here we are. Let's start with the question that prompted this video. Oblivion's main questline is an unremarkable Campbellian romp with lifeless dialogue and a forgettable antagonist. So what makes this game so compelling? Why does a game from 2006 with repetitive gameplay and a broken leveling system frequently come up as one of the most beloved games of all time? Oblivion is built from the ground up to feast on your nostalgia. There's a familiarity to Cyrodiil that's so masterfully intentional. Years can go by and it will still feel like home. But upon returning, after spending a few hours on the cobbled streets, rolling hills, or talking with its people, something feels hollow, weightless. Because there is almost an effective and interesting story being told in Oblivion. Not one of hellish gates and grand heroes, but one of declining empire and the chaos that springs from the embers. And yet at seemingly every turn, Oblivion doesn't see its story or its world through, doesn't follow threads to their natural conclusion. And as we wade further and further out into the vast world of Cyrodiil, it becomes harder and harder not to notice that the water isn't getting any deeper. Oblivion is a fun, sun-drenched fantasy sandbox, but it could have been so much more. So let's talk way too much about Oblivion, starting from the beginning of its forgettable main questline, and look at why so much of it fails to land with the weight it should. There's a kind of inherent tension in the opening moments of these Bethesda games, as they try to balance the desire to hook a player into their main story, while also giving them the freedom to roleplay with as few mental obstacles as possible. Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 came down heavily on the story side, sacrificing a player's roleplay potential to try to sell their narrative. New Vegas follows more in Oblivion's footsteps, albeit much more efficiently, setting up an atmosphere and a mystery in a cinematic, and then getting the player into the open world where they can proceed with their journey with a lighter story direction. I think the reason players enjoy New Vegas' introduction more is because the stakes are lower. You're literally reborn, in a way. Any path you take after Doc Mitchell's is a narratively and morally viable one because the world isn't ending. That isn't the case in Oblivion, something I'll circle back to when we leave the sewers. I was born 87 years ago. For 65 years, I've ruled as Tamriel's emperor. But for all these years, I've never We been... fade in on Emperor Uriel Septim, enveloped in shadow, hands clutching the amulet at his neck. Darkness appears to be encroaching both literally and metaphorically, and as he reflects in the gloom, we smash cut to the realm of oblivion, a horde of Daedra marching towards a glowing gate, ominous music playing. The sound of metal clanging is the emphasis for another smash cut, this time to a sweeping aerial shot of the waters outside the Imperial City, a picturesque landscape that couldn't be further from the hellish industry we've just left. The immaculate white tower of Imperial City stands vigil over central Cyrodiil, and Emperor Septim confesses that these are the final hours of his life. Jeremy Soule's iconic soundtrack booms in a moment of genuine sonic triumph, but we don't pull into an inn or a back alley of this massive city. Instead, we descend, down from the clouds and into a dark, dank prison cell. We're rotting somewhere beneath the city, and the player is never given a reason why. As players, we're now grappling with several questions as we struggle to create a character that doesn't look like it belongs in the reject room at Madame Tussauds. Is the Emperor going to die? Why do the gates of Oblivion pose such a threat? Why are we in prison? For now, I want to touch on the visual motifs that have just been introduced. The iconography of the realm of Oblivion is so classic that it feels immediately familiar. While much of Western fantasy can attribute elements to J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, 
From as early as its opening cinematic, Oblivion appears to be guiltlessly wearing that influence on its sleeve. The quick cuts from a fiery, industrial war machine to a serene landscape tells players, oh, it's that kind of story. In seconds, Bethesda has given players some questions to ask and introduced them to a world that most of them will recognize before they've even set foot in it. The intentionality of that last point specifically fascinates me. The effect is that upon leaving the sewers, the player steps into a world that's familiar, that already feels like a land they know, a land worth defending. Upon completing your abomination, we're greeted with one of the more important interactions of the game, a monologue from a fellow prisoner. I guess they don't play favorites, huh? Your own kinsmen think you're a piece of human trash. I bet the guards give you special treatment before the end. It's disappointing that this is the only significant time your race and gender in Oblivion impact your narrative experience. Oblivion does include personality modifiers depending on the chosen player's race, but it's not something that affects most players in the main quest at least, because there's only one or two times where persuasion actually matters. By the time you hit the second act and have been closing Oblivion gates at a reasonable clip, you'll get a huge disposition boost for being the hero for whatever city you're in. From a narrative angle, the Volandreth dialogue is an efficient bit of world building. If you're going into Oblivion blind, you're given a snippet of dialogue that encapsulates how many in the world might perceive your character. Unless you're playing as a female dark elf, in which things get a bit ickier. You are so beautiful, my dear. One of the guards owes me a favor, you know. I could get us put in the same cell. Would you like that? You should have some fun. Is this the Imperial Prison or Horny Jail? Either way, the Dreth interaction paints a more complex picture of the world than the peaceful, swooping shots did. Players new to this universe are now aware that it is far from utopic, and may be getting the impression that they're in for a more mature, complex narrative. I mean, it's the wrong impression, but from the perspective of developing an atmosphere, I really like this interaction. The arrival of the Emperor cuts the conversation short, thank god, and the Emperor claims to have dreamt of the player, which temporarily keeps the blades from feeding you to the nearby rats. He says their meeting was foretold in the stars, and that, But in your face I behold the sun's companion. The dawn of Akatosh's bright glory may banish the coming darkness. We're already toying with the prophetic, and while that line may blend in on a first playthrough, on subsequent journeys it stands out as obvious prophecy. We are destined to become his son's companion, whose channeling of Akatosh literally banishes the darkness of Mayrune's Dagon. I often see the hero of Kavach described as one of the only Elder Scrolls characters who wasn't a chosen one, but with how deliberately those prophetic beats are hit in this prologue, I'm not sure if that's true. While Martin grows to become the hero that ultimately stops the Oblivion Crisis, I think the player character is too clearly set up as the son's companion for us to assign this all to our own individual agency. I think it would have behooved the narrative to find a way to write this introduction without a prophetic element, or to find stronger ways to subvert that later in the main story. They vaguely allude to the power and nobility of free will in a dialogue exchange with Martin, but it's so frustratingly unexplored that it's hard to not lament the missed opportunity. The best part about this opening section is that there's a non-hostile rat that never attacks you. He just sort of vibes and watches you kill all his disease-riddled kinsmen. With all those fellow rats dead, he's free to feast on the corpses of the goblins and the mythic dawn all by himself, demonstrating a cunning and a survival instinct surpassing every villain in this game. Hang on a second. That's a freebie for anyone out there. Go make some clickbait and cash in on the 700,000 views. You've done us a great service, stranger. We reunite with the Emperor in time to witness his assassination at the hands of the last mythic dawn assassin but not before the Emperor tasks you with bringing the Amulet of Kings to Joffrey, and to Find him, and close shut the jaws of oblivion. The wrap-up conversation with Boris does touch on another interesting idea that Oblivion never really revisits with any intention. How did the assassins know these secret layouts? When he directs you out of the sewers, he says, It's a secret way out of the Imperial City. Or it was supposed to be secret suggesting that the Mythic Dawn may have had some help from the inside, or that their leader is cunning and clever enough to discover Empire secrets. And yet we never really revisit this idea, and the sewer section itself represents a real missed opportunity to establish Mankar Cameron or Dagon as more prominent antagonists. 
I'll expand on this specifically more when we get to a mission in Act 2, but the Mythic Dawn are part of this game that pleasantly surprised me the most under close critique. It's Mangar Cameron that feels painfully underdeveloped, and the story suffers as a result. Again, we return to that balance of plot versus freedom. You may not want to introduce him formally to the player here, and restrict their freedom to roleplay after they leave the sewers, but that burden is already on them after being tasked with delivering the Amulet of Kings. It's not a perfect solution, but if, in the sewers after the Emperor is assassinated, Cameron showed up and defeated the player, taking the Amulet of Kings and alluding to motives higher than mere chaos, we'd have a much clearer line of conflict that still feels optional. The player's body can wash out into the river, and now you're off to Coral to tell Joffrey what happened. As players, having directly clashed with Cameron, we'd then be primed to examine his philosophy in a way that we never are throughout the game now. And after delivering news to Joffrey, he could make it clear to the player that he would have the Blades reach out to Martin themselves, with your help being purely optional. Uninterested players could then ethically opt out of the main story, having done everything a reasonable person could ask. You still have the Kavach beat, bringing Martin to the temple, very little would change. We just have personal stakes in the story, and even more villainous characters could be motivated to track Mankar Cameron down. Suddenly our lines of conflict are much more intimate, and we have a higher motive than just the opposition of a general kind of evil. Part of the reason the Far Cry series gets so much attention for its villains is because it's one of the only game series that bothers developing them. An early, meaningful introduction is crucial to that development. This seems to be a problem that Bethesda themselves are aware of. Their most recent single-player title, Fallout 4, does have a more direct story and first-half antagonist, but it makes the mistake of making the stakes too high. You have a partner and a son, and you watch one die and the other get kidnapped before your eyes. From an immersion standpoint, anything other than mainlining the main quest to find your son seems like a moral failing, which is a problem in a game that's supposed to be an empowering sandbox. For now, however, it's out of the sewers and into the light. And don't worry, I'm not going to go on a rant about how the narrow cave and final sewer corridor kind of simulates a birthing canal. Good. The Emperor's trust was well placed. Having survived the sewers, we step out into the light of Cyrodiil. Even now, after at least a dozen playthroughs, it still manages to feel so powerful and iconic. This moment beautifully distills both the strengths and weaknesses of storytelling in video games. Think about what's happening in this moment. You've escaped from prison, but only after fighting for your life, and you've just seen the Emperor and two of his elite guardsmen cut down before your very eyes. Nevertheless, you push forward on your own, fighting through the darkness and the grime, before you emerge into the light of a world you thought you might never see again. And it's beautiful. And in a novel, this would be a section of prose, one that wouldn't look out of place in a Tolkien-esque story. We'd note the peace and serenity of the outside world, how starkly it contrasts with the darkness and the violence we've just experienced. I want to highlight a passage from Fellowship of the Ring, right after the Fellowship escapes the mines of Moria. The prosaic descriptions of the landscape slow the story back down, a moment of respite for both reader and Fellowship alike. Now, to be fair, Tolkien needs no excuse to describe a landscape, but look at the imagery conjured here. In both passages, we're seeing light overcoming the shadows, how three white peaks were shining, and its southern end was beyond the shadows under the sunlit sky. We get these beautiful descriptions of water. A torrent flowed like white lace over an endless ladder of short falls, and a mist of foam hung in the air about the mountain's feet. The rapid-fire simile and metaphor combine to create a little moment of poetry here. The white lace brings forth this idea of purity, almost as if the visual is a cleansing force after so much darkness. I think we hit similar beats in this moment here. Out of the claustrophobic dark, we enter a land of verdancy. The water in front of the player looks so peaceful, so clean after the damp of the sewers. I also like the little touch of the dock here for multiple reasons. This is literally the launching off point of our metaphorical voyage, and it functions as a bit of a wing to Morrowind players, whose journey also began on a dock. The boat is a nice bit of environmental storytelling. We don't know if it's for the Blades or the Assassins, but by now we know that it doesn't really matter either way. In games, these moments where we slow down the story and use the scenery or nature to organically change the pace are exponentially harder to manufacture, unless we're taking away control from the player. Sometimes they can be created extrinsically, 
In Dark Souls or a Resident Evil game, reaching a bonfire or a safe room literally acts as a moment of respite. But the game that I think does these moments the best is Ghosts of Tsushima. Apart from just being so beautiful, you're probably going to stop every few minutes and just look around. Bathing in hot springs also boosts Jin's health, and the game literally slows things down there. The player can then select a topic on which Jin will then meditate. There's also opportunities for Jin to find a secluded spot and compose a haiku, the player choosing different lines of poetry inspired from the world around them. It creates a handful of quiet moments that help to remind the player of the stakes in the story and of the beauty all around them, that they're fighting for something. Narratively, this moment in Oblivion is a little different. It's one of rest, of relief, taking in the beauty of the world and gearing up for the journey ahead. We've now been introduced to Oblivion's primary intention, the battle between the darkness of industry and the pastoral innocence of the natural world. The symbolism gets much more heavy-handed when we move on to Oblivion Gates, with the literal dark towers, grinding gears, and complex mechanisms, but a prison too is a symbol of development and industry, as are the escape tunnels under the city. What better way to show that this is a city of intrigue and darkness than to have its most powerful person know a secret, built-in way to escape it? Another thing I adore about this moment is how organically it can motivate a refusal of the call. So before we go any further, it's time for an obligatory chat about Joseph Campbell. Anytime we're talking about more traditional hero stories, Joseph Campbell's name or ideas are likely going to be referenced. While work around mythic narrative tropes traces all the way back to 1871, Joseph Campbell is usually credited for advancing these conversations into the pop culture mainstream through his 1949 book The Hero with a Thousand Faces and subsequent work. If the name isn't ringing a bell already, you'll likely recognize some of these terms and structures as we dive into them. For looking at Oblivion's questline, I think using the lens of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, also known as the monomyth, gives us a strong jumping off point for talking about the story's strengths and weaknesses. I want to emphasize that I certainly don't think deviations from monomythic structure are inherently bad. I like to use it as a framework to guide discussions on narrative, but it's by no means a checklist. I really can't emphasize that last point enough. If I cover more games, I'm sure we'll build on this idea, but Campbell is relevant to Oblivion because Oblivion structurally evokes it. Games don't need to hit these beats to tell compelling stories, and in fact the narrative canvas presented by video games is so unique and multidimensional that it presents a new frontier of storytelling, one that is well positioned to innovate and subvert existing ideas about what stories can be and how we can tell them. For now, I want to draw attention to how closely Oblivion's narrative beats align with the streamlined hero's journey, and it'll help us dissect why Oblivion feels like it has all the pieces to work, but why the main questline still falls flat. This first act especially hits these moments beat for beat, the Emperor literally calls us to adventure. The refusal moment is a bit more complicated, but we'll touch on that in a second. From there, we meet the mentor, Joffrey, an accomplished bladesman that plays the role of a monk at Wayne and Priory. At Kvatch, we cross the first threshold, literally, from the comforts of Cyrodiil into the fiery unknowns of Oblivion. Oblivion then represents the belly of the whale, our first real, tangible threat. I think it's no coincidence that this story's first act, which hits these familiar beats quickly and effectively, feels the strongest. On a side note, what I also love about games like this is just how much monomythic story structure is reflected in non-scripted gameplay loops. We start from a zone of comfort, but we want something, whether that's a specific weapon, spell, gold, or whatever, so we enter the unknown. We fight our way through, get what we wanted or something comparable, and return to the safety of our original world, having changed, usually with more experience or better gear. The fact that that action alone is a fully-fledged story in itself always struck me as a huge part of the reason open-world RPGs are so popular. But for now, I want to expand a bit on one of the key moments of the early hero's journey, and probably my personal favorite for this kind of hero story. The Refusal of the Call. The Refusal of the Call is one of the more instrumental moments in creating a believable protagonist. And yet it's difficult to simulate that in a game because these moments tend to be driven by either fear or responsibility. Learn the ways of the force. Oh. I've got to get home. It's late. I'm in for it as it is. In the Elder Scrolls, we have neither. Game characters who immediately and fearlessly throw themselves into the action usually feel more one-dimensional. And depending on the genre, that's great. 
we don't necessarily need these moments from Master Chief, for example, because it's already believable that a super soldier would dedicate himself to the defense of humanity without a second thought. That's not to say that characters like these aren't worth exploring either. Master Chief is a great example because he probably knows that his helmet, his armor, that the symbol of Master Chief means more to humanity than the man wearing it. His silence, his determination, his insanely traumatic backstory. These are all things that build him into this tragic icon of death, and that's worth exploring too. God of War 2018 is a fascinating character exploration of what happens when this kind of hero chooses to slow down, to reflect, to withdraw from the world, and then re-engage with it as a changing man. However, for characters who start from nothing, like the classic mythic hero, having moments of doubt is what makes them so compelling. Our characters in the Elder Scrolls are those kind of heroes. We start at level 1, there's no pre-existing relationships to go back to, no job or hideout waiting for us. For a relative novice to just step out of the sewers, having just witnessed an assassination and survived a brush with death, and then go tearing off to Coral, then immediately hurl themselves into an oblivion gate outside Gavage, it's just boring. As a scripted hero, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. But part of why Assassin's Creed's Ezio is such a beloved protagonist is that we got to see him grow into the hero role. He doesn't set out from Florence ready to commit to a methodical dismantling of the Templar Order. He doesn't even know about the Assassin Brotherhood. One of my favorite moments in the game happens as he literally flees the city, his sister desperately asking him questions, and Ezio telling her that he doesn't know. How could this have happened to us? I don't know. Will we ever be back? I don't know. He's scared, frustrated. We can hear in his voice that the brave face he's put on for his mother and sister is slipping. While Ezio will go on to have a formal refusal of the call moment. For the humanizing factor, it doesn't get much better than this moment, at least for me. When his quest later becomes more about just revenge, we're connected to it as players because we've gone on this journey with him. We've watched Ezio work his way back up from nothing, watched him experience fear and doubt, and become the measured, wisecracking shepherd of a brotherhood to which he and the player both now have a connection. I think Oblivion incentivizes players to have this moment, but because of its dedication to player freedom over everything, it never scripts it formally. The player will likely emerge from the sewers with an inventory bursting with gear, and feel like they need to take a trip up into the city to sell some of it and restock. Other players might see the ruins across the water and swim over to explore, I do like that the Amulet of Kings will simply haunt your inventory until you proceed to Coral. You can't drop it, nor can you wear it. It just looms there as a reminder of your forsaken obligation. It's not much, but Oblivion will always prioritize freedom and fun over narrative theme or cohesion, and for an Elder Scrolls playable protagonist, that's kind of forgivable given the genre. Where Oblivion bungles this moment is with Martin Septum, the game's traditional scripted hero. So let's go see about a Coral. Whenever you're ready to set off for the Priory, you can take the long, winding northward road, or you can take out your map and fast travel to the Coral Gates in seconds, another reflection of Bethesda's dedication to freedom over immersion. It's difficult to overstate the consequences of this immediate access to free fast travel. Suddenly the wide world of Cyrodiil feels small, tamed, overly constructed, and the player can magically hop from city to city without spending a coin. When players utilize this fast travel feature, it makes the cities feel like they exist in a vacuum, and a world built around meticulous detail suddenly feels more like a set of small playgrounds to bounce between. This is a mistake Bethesda themselves seem to have recognized, as in Skyrim, players have to at least discover cities before they can fast travel to them. I'm also sensitive to the argument of time and convenience. Not everyone has hours to dedicate to a game session, so for a player with an hour or less a day to play, Having to spend a majority of their game time trekking from Leowind to Chaden Hall would be frustrating, especially when it's clear that the majority of dev time went into cities, dungeons, and people, and not the wilds in between those things. It's good for games to have fast travel settings as an option, or a fast travel system incorporated into the game, like a more robust version of the carriage system in Skyrim, but from a storytelling angle, it's difficult to ignore the fact that both Oblivion and Skyrim would be objectively better narrative experiences without fast travel. Not only would the world and journeys feel larger and longer, but the opportunities for environmental storytelling would increase exponentially. Suddenly the barrier between the wild and civilization would be given a weight and a significance. Roads and shortcuts could become familiar to the player, and the sight of an upcoming city or village would bring a relief that would increase immersion. 
In Oblivion, this immersion comes in the form of faded imperial roads, rickety road signs that foreshadow Kavach's dark fate, a weary guardsman patrolling the hills on horseback. As you climb the hill northward, the road to Coral will take you under Fort Ash, a crumbled old imperial fort and another indicator of the Empire's slow decay. A highwayman leaps out from behind a rock on the other side of the old fort, attempting to catch travelers by surprise. As the sun sets through the trees of the Great Forest, it's hard to not just stop and breathe it in, if only for a moment. It's the moments like these that make Cyrodiil feel so picturesque, make it feel like a land worth fighting for, and yet these are the exact moments that will be missed by just opening the map and fast traveling. While I'd argue that this first act is the game's strongest, the symbolism present is still fairly ham-fisted. We meet the Grandmaster of the Blades and narrative mentor figure Joffrey in Wayne and Priory, a place of worship. This chapel on the outskirts of the forest is staffed by a handful of brothers, all sporting traditional monk robes and unfortunate haircuts. How goes it? Good evening. Hey, we're a symbol of innocence. Might as well be carved into the stonework, though we know from Joffrey's presence that innocence certainly does not equate to pacifism. The close ties between the Priory and the Forest continue to sketch out one side of Oblivion's core ideological conflict. It's a tension that will likely sound familiar to anyone who has experienced some form of Western fantasy. The virtuosity of nature, of community, of a certain level of piety, versus the evil of industry, of greed, of excess ambition. Oblivion's heroic locations are all in nature. Wayne and Priory in the Forest, the Priory of the Nine is in a wooded valley, Cloud Ruler Temple is up in the mountains. I think it's significant that the way shrines are also all in the wilds of Cyrodiil. For a pilgrimage or absolution, one must travel the vast expanse of Cyrodiil's land. Forgiveness comes alongside pastoral communion. I think it's interesting that simply traveling to every chapel doesn't suffice. It's a small but fascinating thematic implication, and I wish we explored Oblivion's view of goodness a bit more. We've already seen flashes of the other side of this coin, a kind of Mordor-at-home evil that gestures towards industry in Algieri-esque hellscapes. It's a kind of generic evil that even extends to Mangar's paradise at the game's conclusion. And yet we're also already encountering characters that disrupt this good-evil duality. We've learned that Martin, the last of the Septims and the only one that can stop the Oblivion Crisis, was born as a bastard, a mistake that the Emperor had shepherded away in the middle of the night by his personal bodyguard. While this ends up being an act that inadvertently saves the mortal realm, I don't think that this culture would consider siring a bastard son to be a virtuous act. We'll later come to learn that Martin himself has had brushes with the darkness, encounters with Daedra that left a friend dead. The player character themselves can become the leader of the Dark Brotherhood, carrying out assassination contracts with seemingly no compunction, all the while still hurling themselves into oblivion gates to save the lives of total strangers. So we have a world that's been built around this duality of good and evil, and yet its most powerful characters, Martin and the player character, are those with a foot on each side. I'll expand on this a bit as we go, and then a lot towards the end, because Mangar Cameron's final monologue alludes to a character that reshaped the way I look at this balance, and it's something I wish Oblivion handled with more intention. As we set off towards Kavach and Martin Septim, the closer we get to the city, the more obvious it is that something is wrong. Blackened hills cut into the horizon, and we can see burnt trees twisting up into the sky. At the crossroads between Skingrad, Kavach, and Anvil, there's a bandit camp suspiciously close to the road, as though they know no one's coming to stop them. On the base of the switchbacks leading up to the city, there's a makeshift refugee camp forming. Further up the road, a priest despairs by torchlight, claiming that the gods have forsaken everyone and that the enemy has already won. The closer we get to Kavach, we see that he's not far off. This slow, ratcheting up tension works fairly well as you move from Coral to Kavach, though it's once again a narrative element players can miss if they simply leave the Priory and fast travel to the city. Seeing the burnt trees from a distance, the blackened land, it's such a terrifying contrast to the idyllic greenery of the Great Forest, or the grassy plains of the Gold Coast. Seeing what this dark force has already done makes crossing this first threshold voluntarily seem more dangerous. Skyrim's dragons embody the ancient and mysterious wild, a fitting enemy for a more decentralized tribal civilization. They're still afraid of that dark. 
Most in Cyrodiil don't fear the wild, so it's fitting that Oblivion Gates are a constructed evil, a dark mirror to the civilized imperial world. That realm of Oblivion is a fiery hellscape, its architecture one of dark, spiky towers. Everything is black, gray, red, orange. Everything is meticulously placed for some act of miscellaneous violence. Mayrune's Dagon's realm feels exactly like you'd think it would, and given the quantity of gates you're tasked with closing over the course of the series, they'll quickly lose all fear and almost all luster, and a majority of players will soon find themselves hurtling through them like Patrick Bateman heading in for another day of work at the office. This lack of creativity in the realm's design, as well as the growing monotony of the gates, quickly undermines the threat of Mayrune's Dagon himself, which is a problem when the mortal antagonist, Mangar Cameron, is also so underdeveloped. This realm of generic evil would be less tedious if it was merely a tool being wielded by Cameron to achieve some end, or if there was a compelling vision for the society that would spring forth from the ashes. Instead, we learn almost nothing until some rushed Cameron monologue at the end of the game, so for now, all we know is that this realm of fire and death wants to invade Cyrodiil and turn it into an empire of ashes for… reasons? Returning to our Campbellian themes, this crossing of the first threshold does represent a powerful one in the player's journey. It's one of the first times it feels like we're making an active choice, playing the part of a hero willingly, not out of an obligation. We've entered into a new, dangerous world. The first time you shut a Kvatch gate, you really do feel heroic. I wish the quantity and repetitive nature of Oblivion Gates didn't water down that emotion so much. Furthermore, crossing this threshold brings us in direct contact with the other half of Oblivion's duality, the fiery evils of industry, a dark personification of war and violence. While its familiarity lessens its impact from a fear and gameplay perspective, it does bring in a kind of mythic gravitas. This is THE evil. An evil so distilled, even a crack in its walls will raise a city to the ground. As both players and characters, we step into the realm of oblivion and we know we have to stop this. And it's a simple evil that works as a mechanism, but becomes tedious when it's asked to support the entire plot. But that's where Martin Septim and Mankar Cameron come in. Like most elements of Oblivion, Martin's character functions the best for me in this first act. He's soft-spoken, fairly unimpressed with your accomplishments, and openly questioning the will and power of the gods to whom he's dedicated his life. If all this is part of a divine plan, I'm not sure I want to have anything to do with it. His mundanity, his doubt, his growing cynicism, all of these traits make him a relatable and believable character. This is a man who grew up with almost nothing and just watched the city he served reduced to ashes overnight, its people massacred in an unthinking slaughter. His doubt and fury with the gods is something he'll bear for the rest of the game, and makes his split-second sacrifice during the game's climax all the more powerful. That the last heir of Uriel Septim became a brother of Akatosh and helped shelter fleeing citizens in the church, the lone building to survive the dangerous wrath, is another important piece of symbolism in Oblivion. Martin's priesthood is yet another symbol to add to the growing pile of piety and virtuosity equals good, chaos and ambition equals bad duality that Oblivion continues to build on. Granted, it's the furthest thing from groundbreaking. Usually these ideas really only stick out when they're subverted, like we see with the eternal fire in The Witcher 3, but it's still worth noting. Martin complicates things by having seemingly abandoned his faith at this point in the story, something he'll allegedly struggle with as we proceed through the narrative. And yet, jumping way ahead, he couldn't have saved Cyrodiil without his final act of faith, which ties his arc back in with Oblivion's broader motifs of faith and virtue being the ultimate capital G good traits. For now, though, he buys into the idea of himself as the heir to the Septim Throne surprisingly quickly, and trusts the player enough to follow them back to Joffrey. This is another moment where Oblivion's disinterest in its own story and characters rears its head. Martin accepting his heritage in seconds feels too convenient, and it's as if you could feel the guiding hand of Bethesda just trying to push the player through this moment and back into their beautiful world. Returning to Coral with Martin, the two of you find the Priory under attack. The sneaky star of this sequence is Martin, who quickly shows himself to be a competent mage, a part of his backstory will build on in the game's second act. It's interesting that he uses ice magic here, the opposite element to the fires of Oblivion. Later in the game, when he's going into battle, I think he also wields a silver longsword of frost. It's a little touch, but I like the attention to detail. One of the brothers fears for Joffrey, saying that he may need our help, so we proceed to the chapel where the Grand Master of the Blades is facing down two Mythic Dawn agents. It's an awkward fight that begins even more awkwardly, with Joffrey spouting the line, 
I'll take the one on the right. Before beginning to clumsily hack at the back of the cultist with his katana, the blood smeared on the walls of the chapel does create a powerful visual, however, and stands in stark contrast to the relative peace of the Kavach chapel. It feels like the last line of protection has just been crossed. It seems like it's this violation of innocence that Oblivion is relying on to make you feel something here. Most players will have spent maybe four minutes in Wayne and Priory, so seeing it attack doesn't really raise the stakes. Seeing Brother Maberell's corpse outside by the well doesn't really mean anything since we never really interacted with him. If anything, it just means there's now a free horse at the stable. It's a bit of a missed opportunity because if the player spent a few quests here before setting off for Kavach, perhaps while Joffrey located Martin, then the player will have bonded with both the Priory and the people within it, making its eventual attack more personally meaningful. An RPG that handled a moment like this better is the original Fable game, first getting players attached to Oakvale through early game quests, then having them watch it all get taken away. Instead, this moment falls flat. Yes, the mythic dawn are evil, but everyone at the Priory was armed to the teeth. It just feels like another battle in a small war rather than an impactful strike from evil at this alleged heart of innocence. Someone from the Mythic Dawn succeeded in taking the Amulet of Kings, and Joffrey insists we take Martin to Cloud Ruler Temple while we plan our next move. Martin, Joffrey, and the player head to the stables before clambering onto horses and setting off into the east for Bruma. This moment feels so stilted, so odd. The three ride in silence, wasting an excellent opportunity for Joffrey and Martin to connect. Even though Bethesda can't give the player something to say here, wasn't Joffrey the one who took Martin at the Emperor's bidding and checked in on him from time to time? Couldn't this be an opportunity for Martin to voice his displeasure at the gods and possible resentment for a father that left him to be raised an orphan? Instead of anything interesting, we just get the rhythmic glopping of a dead man's horse, and we proceed to the Gerald Mountains. Martin gives a grounded, humble speech at Cloud Ruler Temple, and says that he hopes he proves himself worthy of their loyalty in the days ahead. All of you, I know you all expect me to be emperor. I'll do my best, but this is all new to me. I'm not used to giving speeches, but I, I wanted you to know that I appreciate your welcome here. I hope I prove myself worthy of your loyalty in the coming days. That's it. Thank you. Well then, thank you, Martin. We'd all best get back to our duties, eh, Captain? Joffrey sounds a little underwhelmed, and Martin comes to you afterward and expresses his own doubts, saying that he doesn't know what to do. The blade saluting me and hailing me as Martin Septim. I don't mean to sound ungrateful. I know I would be dead by now if it weren't for you. Thank you. But everyone expects me to suddenly know what to do, how to behave. They want an emperor to tell them what to do, and I haven't the faintest idea. To which our character replies, in the only available dialogue choice, we need to get the amulet back. Martin agrees. But it's interesting that this is really the only time in the main questline that your character actually drives the action, actively suggesting something as opposed to just being the errand boy in shining armor. It's disappointing that this moment of alleged agency is still so railroaded that it's literally the only option, even another more grey choice of, I don't know, I got you here, my part in this is over, would have been a welcome addition, and perhaps given Martin or Joffrey the chance to talk you into staying. Unfortunately, Oblivion's main quest really only has room for one kind of hero, the hero who does big, brave deeds when and where they're told. Martin is still uncertain of everything, himself most of all, and we'll see him compensate by surrounding himself with books during his stay at Cloud Ruler Temple. The first act ends with the bastard heir secured, and our heroes now turn themselves to the next step, retrieving the amulet. Oblivion's first act has been a fairly tight fantasy story, introducing a familiar feeling setting in characters. A wise emperor, a young warrior eager to prove himself, a grizzled warrior monk, a jaded chosen one, a wondrously green landscape besieged by fiery, hellish darkness. There's a mystery building about who is behind the mythic dawn, and why anyone would aid Beirun's Dagon in his invasion. With the emperor safe, we're tasked with joining Boris back in the imperial city to track down the Amulet of Kings, and thus begins our second act. If I had a nickel for every premier RPG that began their second act with a trip to the big city full of dark secrets and culty undertones, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. 
To borrow more language from the hero's journey, the second act usually begins with a road of trials. In Oblivion, it starts with us searching for the Amulet of Kings, and to find it, we're working with Boris to learn more about the mythic dawn. I enjoy the unorthodox start to this quest. Boris is in a boarding house in a part of the city the player is unlikely to have spent much time in before. When we try to start a conversation, ready for our obligatory story moment where someone talks at us and tells us what to do, instead Boris says, Don't say anything. Just do what I say. So we sit, our gleaming new blades armor clanking against the seat of the wooden stool, the picture of anonymity. Boris is being followed and asks us to stalk his stalker into the basement. We do, and like all things in Oblivion, it ends in violence, and Boris explains the gambit. He'll keep running down leads on the Mythic Dawn network while we take the suspicious book we found on the agent's corpse to a scholar at the nearby college. She advises we complete our collection of the books, which eventually leads us back into the sewers for an undercover meetup with a recruiter from the Mythic Dawn. Boris is all too happy to show us a route down into the sewers and confidently leads us to where this meeting will take place. He mentions that the Blades use the sewers to navigate the city frequently, and when I was playing through Oblivion and really focusing on the details, it's hard to not see that as anything but a little icky. Because they're the alleged good guys, it's never really challenged in the narrative, but later in the second act, there's a mission that really reframes the Mythic Dawn, at least in my estimation. So following the Emperor's secret enforcer down into a sewer system with access to half the city that he knows like the back of his hand feels a little dark. Boris volunteers to meet with a recruiter, posing as a prospective recruit, and it's possible that he can die here if you're not careful. I think his death could have worked well for the darker and more grounded tone of the second act, but because of the jankiness of Oblivion's combat, if Boris dies, it's likely going to feel more like comedy than tragedy. I didn't learn this until I was doing some reading after my playthroughs, but one of the Mythic Dawn members in this encounter is Raven Cameron, Menkar's son. He's the one who engages with Boris, or the player, if you insist on being the one pretending to join. But even here, in a quiet, face-to-face -face moment, the opportunity to expand on the Mythic Dawn, or even hear their perspective, is wasted. If this moment had any more missed potential, it'd be the 2022 Mets. The player can be face-to-face -face with the second or third highest ranking member of the Mythic Dawn, and yet the interaction never even has the option to eventually move to a dialogue tree. That's a problem. Even if it's excusable here, it's certainly not by the time we get to our final confrontation with Mankar in Act 3. The fact that the player can't ask Mankar Cameron about why he started all of this is a problem. This sewer confrontation with Raven and his fellow members could have gone so many other ways, and I think pretty much all of them would have been more interesting than how it goes down in this moment here. Imagine how much more uncanny this moment would be if Raven Cameron had an eerie calm, even in the presence of the hero of Kavach, because he knows death is mostly meaningless to him. Or if his soldiers took Boris hostage, or if the player could possibly keep talking their way into the dawn, leading to an alternate start to the cave infiltration or possibly skipping it entirely. This entire part of the game is trying to feel more subtle, grounded, and mysterious, yet the player's actions are none of the above. We solve this problem the only way the game allows. Thoughtless violence, emphasis on the thoughtless. We also discover that here in the sewers, the same sewers that the blades used to get around, there's been a little mythic dawn base this whole time. It's a possible hint as to how they may have found the Emperor's secret passageways back in the beginning of the game, and another indicator that the Empire is rotting from the inside. How was this able to stay hidden for this long? With all four volumes in hand, we head to Tarmina, who instructs us to look for clues. Mangar Cameron, the author of the volumes, is the mind behind the Septim assassination, so surely he hid it. What's that? Oh, the instructions are spelled out in the giant, conspicuous red letters? Oh, gotcha, okay. The location of their secret hideout uncovered, we leave the Imperial City behind and head for Chaden Hall, hot on the trail of the Amulet of Kings. Dawn is breaking. Welcome, brother. The hour is late, but the master still has need for willing hands. It's in these next two missions that the Mythic Dawn are fleshed out just a bit more. Infiltrating the stronghold is easy, surprisingly easy, even in full blades gear. You give them the password phrase and they greet you as a new brother immediately, no questions asked. When I first played through this game, I think that struck me as kind of silly, but especially when you remember that this is a cult, the welcoming angle really makes sense. 
Part of the reason the Mythic Dawn has grown as large as they have is because they appear to welcome anyone who can find their hideout and wants to join, which means they're easier to join than the Mages College, Thieves Guild, or Dark Brotherhood. With how poorly many in Cyrodiil seem to be treated, it makes sense that having this cultish little family could appeal to many. And this, again, might not have stuck out to me as much on this playthrough except for something else I was starting to notice. It seems like the vast majority of the Mythic Dawn come from Cyrodiil's lower classes. This revelation didn't really hit me until I completed another mission from Joffrey, where you take down the Mythic Dawn spies in Bruma. The second spy, Jarol, lives humbly in a row of small shacks on the edge of Bruma, under the shadow of the Great Chapel of Talos. It's not difficult to fathom how resentment might ferment as she toils away while others in this world live so well and so easily. This is an idea that Mengar preaches during the Shrine mission before he disappears back to his paradise. He tells his followers the words of Mayrin's Dagon. When I walk the earth again, the faithful among you shall receive your reward, to be set above all other mortals forever. The clearest way we have to differentiate class at a glance in Oblivion is clothing. There's even a check system for what constitutes elegant dress and what doesn't, and it comes up in the Sanguine questline. Throughout my playthrough, I only remember encountering one Mythic Dawn agent who had fine clothes on their corpse when they died. The rest were in lower class clothing. If we consider the implications of that, suddenly it makes sense why they're willing to fight and die to see this world burn. Most of them likely feel like they have no place in it already. The most compelling way to read the Mythic Dawn is as a symptom of this rotting empire, not the cause of it. I know it's easy to see this land as an ideal of sorts, to remember it and think of the calming soundtrack and the sun-drenched hills, and think that Cyrodiil is a utopian society under hellish siege, but the game itself portrays a much darker world. There are beggars in every town, despite the fact that in every town there are also chapels and empty houses. The Imperial City's primary form of entertainment is an arena in which combatants fight to the death, despite the fact that this world has extremely potent restoration magics. There are really only two reasons these fights have to be to the death, and that's either for the pleasure of the citizens, or because their lives are cheaper than the cost to heal them. Either answer is a dark one. The arena attendees are also coded as lower class dressed in drab grays and browns. Even the box the player can view matches in is stocked with cheap wine. A critical examination of this would lead many to connect it to ancient Rome, whose ruling class used the Colosseum as a way to distract the masses from the crumbling or unjust empire around them. Comparing Cyrodiil to ancient Rome was a take I originally thought may come across as too pretentious, or make me sound like I'm someone who says Des Volt unironically, but I found the sentiment echoed in the game's official guide. It's a shame Oblivion really only conveys these ideas through its environmental storytelling, because if handled directly, the Mythic Dawn could have been a much more compelling force. This is why I'll express so much disappointment with Mankar Cameron when we get to his paradise in Act 3. Not only does he play too small a part in this game's story, but because there are serious problems in the world of Cyrodiil, and yet his motives never seem to extend beyond bloodlust and a strange loyalty to Mayrune's Dagon. If it all still sounds like too much of a stretch, there are times when side content touches on the inequities and corruptions of Cyrodiil. You can stop a corrupt watchman in the Imperial City, though the citizens are initially too scared to talk to you. Ironically, I got around this in my playthrough by handing out bribes, eventually convincing everyone to testify against the guardsman. He was arrested, but in the prison he vows revenge on the man who put him there. His sentence is multiple years though, so he shouldn't be able to, oh nope, he gets out early, somehow and tracks the player down wherever they are, attacking them. In my case, I was in the streets of Chadenhall, waiting for a shop to open when he snuck up behind me with a dagger. Chadenhall, coincidentally, is where another side quest dealing with corrupt authorities takes place. The captain of the guard is exploiting the townsfolk to the tune of hundreds of septums in the form of fines. One citizen gets his property taken away because he can't pay his fines, so he's kicked out onto the streets and starts drinking even more. When he goes to confront the guardsman in front of his house, he pulls a dagger and the guardsman kills him almost instantly, claiming self-defense. You do eventually prove that the captain is siphoning money from these egregious fines, and the Count has him arrested, though it's again demonstrating how Cyrodiil's authority figures aren't the beacons of justice they're supposed to be. It's not just a blight on the individuals directly involved. It's also a reflection of the system that allows these individuals to abuse power. So there's celebrated blood sport in the capital, corruption in the guard, a dark brotherhood at the height of its strength, operating with little friction. This is why I've tried to point out how Oblivion ties goodness and virtue to nature and piety. I don't think as players we're supposed to find developed Cyrodiil to be a capital G good land. 
It's obviously a better alternative than a land of flame and death under Mayrin's Dagon, and while Cameron's philosophy is never really communicated to the player, after spending enough time in Cyrodiil, we can understand why some would want to see it burn. What we don't understand, however, is what they plan to build from the ashes. Back to the cave for a moment, and back to some Campbell terminology, or more specifically Vogler terminology. Christopher Vogler's description of Act 2 of the Monomyth is a streamlined version of Campbell's, and more reflects modern storytelling. While Campbell's terminology is still applicable, modern storytelling tends to rely less on the woman as temptress, so I like to focus on Vogler's here. Our second act will entail tests, allies, and enemies. We've experienced all of that so far. Boris tracking down the dawn, and now Mankar Cameron. Here, we're literally and figuratively approaching the inmost cave, though that's something we'll also do in the missions for the armor of Tiber Septum and the fancy Aelid Stone. The key component of this stage in our hero's journey is testing our mettle, summoning courage, and overcoming obstacles. The chief obstacle here in this cave is Ruma Cameron, Mankar Cameron's daughter, though that's not communicated to the player in any way aside from the name at the bottom of the screen. I had forgotten I had encountered her in the mortal world, so when I saw her again in her father's terrible paradise and she mentioned we met before, I was kind of confused. You took everything from me. I don't even know who you are. To join the Mythic Dawn, we must sacrifice the Argonian that is currently in a kind of magic slumber on the altar. Grabbing Cameron's book turns the Mythic Dawn hostile, but when you free the Argonian, as he gets up the statue of Mayrun's Dagon looming over the cave shatters, its large stone chunks killing a few members of the Mythic Dawn as it falls. Looting their corpses gives you a much easier fight as you hack and slash your way out, but it's not clear if the statue fell as a result of some spell from the Argonian or if that was a different kind of magic, perhaps some divine intervention. I kind of like that this moment is left ambiguous. You'll later find out that the Argonian is a priest at the Temple of the One in Imperial City, so it could fuel both ideas. It would track that he's powerful enough to maybe bring down the statue himself, and it would also make sense that the gods would try to defend their disciples. If you meet up with him after the events in the cave, he's happy to see you and teaches you some restoration magic. The Mythic Dawn's targeting of an important priest for this sacrifice is also interesting. Yet again, we've got the religious people and iconography of Cyrodiil and the Mythic Dawn on opposite sides, something that Cameron will soon rant about in his Paradise monologues. Additionally, the fact that they were able to kidnap a priest from literally the middle of the Imperial City seems to indicate that they do indeed know how to navigate the old Blades tunnels, something that we've already seen in the opening sewer section and with their secret base we found with Boris. That these tunnels, which we've been told were used as a secret escape for the Emperor and a tool for the Blades, have now been harnessed by the enemies of Cyrodiil is a delicious bit of irony and more evidence that the Empire has gotten far too big for its own good. It can't control the corruption in its ranks, it can't take care of its citizens, we'll soon see that it can't even spare Legion troops to more directly aid in the Oblivion Crisis, and here we've learned that the tools it created to control its people are now being used against them. For now, Mangar Cameron escaped with the amulet to his paradise, so it's back to Cloud Ruler Temple to have a chat with Martin. Martin has made himself more at home in Cloud Ruler Temple, and we find him reading in the main hall with a small stack of books in front of him desperately searching for any information that will help you stop the Oblivion Crisis. This character trait develops in the background as the main quest progresses, and by the time you're back with everything you need to chase Cameron into his paradise, Martin will have dragged another table over to his workstation and covered that one with books as well. It's a little moment that could be easy to miss, but it adds a lot to Martin's character and gives him a little discount Aragorn flavor. Having Martin be the brains of the operation, diving into old tomes, trying to discover how to chase Cameron, works well since as the player character we're going to have to be the brawn. We'll later find out that Martin's wisdom was hard earned, but for now I want to note how Martin's kingly traits are his knowledge and his earnestness. Crucially, it's not his strength. It's a sharp contrast to the might makes right kind of rule we'll encounter from characters like Ulfric and Skyrim, and it shows us that despite its flaws, Cyrodiil is still a kind of capital C civilized world that can value traits unrelated to violence. Jumping ahead a bit, Martin's sacrifice isn't one of physical strength, it's one of quick thinking and bravery. I love how well this balances out the player character, who is almost always going to be a combat powerhouse regardless of playstyle. Martin is piecing together what's needed to follow Cameron, a Daedric artifact, the old armor of Tiber Septum, a Welkland stone, and a great sigil stone. This second act is going to be all about getting these items, and while I think it's Oblivion's weakest part of the story, the pieces were there for this to feel better than it does. A quest for a sacred item is a tried and true fantasy or mythic story, to the point where, in the biz, we refer to this kind of story as a grail quest. 
I don't know why I just said biz as though most story nerds do anything other than complain on subreddits or make weird videos like this while trying not to calculate the interest on their student loan debts. One more coin and I can get a pair of shoes. Stories like The Lord of the Rings would then constitute a reverse grail quest. Instead of questing for an object, we're questing to destroy an object. I think part of why the second act falters is because of the quantity of these fetch quests. We're seeking magical items to perform a ritual, all to recover an even more special magical item. It has a result of making everything feel more mundane than it should. This could have been somewhat alleviated by more compelling gameplay in each of these dungeon areas. Sankrator underwhelms and the Aelid Ruin's hollowed exterior quickly feels like any other ruin once you get inside. It's disappointing because there's a lot of symbolism they could have played with. We're gathering artifacts from different areas of Cyrodiil's pantheon and history. The Divines in Tiber Septim's armor, the Daedra in the artifact, the Aelid Elves with the fancy stone, and the Mythic Dawn and Mayrun's Dagon alliance in the form of the Great Sigil Stone. If each one of these missions rewarded the player with both the item and some nugget of wisdom, or a piece of the larger puzzle, or some fascinating lore, we might have felt like more than just an overqualified errand boy. Instead, the end result feels lackluster. We start with the Daedric artifact, and we're directed towards the nearby Shrine of Azura. In my younger, foolish days, I mistakenly thought Azura Star was a bit shit, and handed it over to Martin without question. Surely this glorified soul gem wasn't worth keeping. Now I am wiser, stronger, more aware of how insanely cracked Azura Star can be given how many enchantment options players have if they're closing Oblivion Gates at a healthy pace. So instead of meeting a more traditional goddess, in the Cambellian sense, not a Nine Divines one, and seeking her boon, we're off to a hill northwest of Skingrad for the Shrine of Sanguin, lusty Daedric Prince of Revelry. After an offering of Cyrodiilic brandy, Sanguin sends you off to Leowin, where he's tasked the player with sneaking into the Countess's dinner party and casting a spell. Crucially, he doesn't tell you what it is, just that, I think it will make the party much more interesting. After getting into the party, no easy feat, you can cast your spell on the Countess, which immediately removes her clothing and the clothing of most of her guests. Oh, and yours too. Unsurprisingly, the guards find this less amusing than you do and try to arrest you, and then you have no gold to pay your fine. So now you're running in your underwear up the marshy roads along the lower Nibbon, hoping Sanguine is happy with this act of chaotic debauchery. Fortunately, he is, and he returns your items and bestows his whimsical boon, Sanguine's Rose. Returning the rose to Martin rewards the player with an additional bit of his backstory. I never thought to see this again. I once possessed it, briefly. This line is interesting because of the implications around Martin's confession. As players, we're primed to look at Martin as a virtuous character. He's intelligent, curious, soft-spoken, and a man of cloth. But we've had allusions to a darker history, one that he's reformed from. I use reform carefully there because I think Oblivion is framing Martin's turning away from Sanguine as a good thing. This falls in line with Oblivion's more broad Judeo-Christian moral structure. In the realms of Oblivion, in which many of the halls or buildings are named after dark and evil things, lust is one of the sins used in these names. It once again feels like a missed opportunity. As a bastard himself, Martin is the product of lust, a sin in this world, and yet he's the only reason Cyrodiil will exist in its current form by the end of the main quest. Not only would Martin not exist if Uriel was as virtuous as he was supposed to be, but Martin wouldn't be the man he was today if he didn't stray in his younger days. We'll expand more on this complexity later, but I just want to note these moments as we go. The Sankrator quest underwhelms, both visually and narratively. Going into a cursed fort, freeing the spirits of old blades to allow them to finally fulfill their mission could have been interesting, but it just falls so flat. The ghost of the first blade talks about a curse being laid on the ruins by the Ender King, but he's since departed and the mission amounts to killing skeletons with blades gear and then letting their ghosts do a janky animation to clear the curse and to get the armor. I don't mind that we introduce villains and darkness beyond the mythic dawn or Mayrun's Dagon, in fact I welcome it, but this felt like such an ineffectual way to do it. There are times the sparse storytelling of Oblivion works in its favor. I think about how effectively creepy the subplot of the Deep Ones and Hackdirt is as a prime example. I stumbled upon Hackdirt on my way to Kavach from Wayne and Priory back at the start of the game, but you return to the town in earnest when you're rescuing a coral shopkeeper's daughter. The town had fallen on hard times after being burned down by the Imperial Legion, 
It's implied that the Legion may have raised hack dirt because of their worship of entities called the Deep Ones that they found in their minds, entities that seem to have required human sacrifice. Someone in hack dirt has since claimed to be able to communicate with them again. So, with the town still suffering in intense poverty, most of the citizens are on board to start up the sacrifices once more. Like the Mythic Dawn, it's important to note that these are people with almost nothing, and in desperation they turn to these mysterious, cosmic entities. Unlike the Mythic Dawn, we know almost nothing about the Deep Ones. We can't understand their Bible, and if you go into the caves there isn't a way down, but you can hear some horribly creepy sounds. I like that kind of mysterious, undefined, ancient evil. It can make the world feel larger, more lived in. But Hackdurd has evil in layers. There's the desperate people there who have turned to kidnapping and sacrifice to try to improve their lives, and then there's the deep evil we don't see or understand. Here in Zonkrator, we're just told that there was an interesting and powerful underking, but he's gone now and his curse is ready to be broken as soon as you kill some skeletons. Returning to Martin, we give him the armor, and he, in turn, gives us our next task. Retrieve a great Welkin stone from the old Aelin capital of Miskarond. Like Zancrator, this would have been a great opportunity to make Cyrodiil feel older, more mysterious, and yet once we delve into Miskarond, it never really feels like an old capital. It feels like just another design dungeon, and our understanding of the world isn't really deepened in any way. The only thing that's tested is our combat prowess, not our beliefs or our bravery. It's a shame because of how Bethesda could have mirrored the fall of the current empire with the fall of the Aelid peoples. There's two books on Martin's desk that I want to touch on before we push on to our third act. The first being Glories and Laments Among the Aelid Ruins, which he encourages players to read before we leave for Miskarond. On the subject of the Welkin Stones, the author writes, They did not secure the Aelids against their true enemies, which were not the slaves who revolted and overthrew their cruel masters, nor were they the savage beast peoples who learned the crafts of war and magic from their Aelid masters. No, it was the arrogant pride of their achievements, their smug self-assurance that their empire would last forever, that doomed them to fail and fade into obscurity. Hmm. Hmm. If only we knew of a declining empire whose oppressed peoples are rising against it or was under attack by a more wild and dangerous force. An empire so drunk on its own glory that it's been blinded to its fall into stagnation and rot. The Imperial City is literally built around the old Aelid capital. The White Gold Tower, the most architecturally impressive and iconic building in the game, was the Aelid Seat of Power. All the pieces were there for a thoughtful moment grounded in Elder Scrolls lore, and yet Oblivion never explicitly connects these dots. So it just feels like such a missed opportunity to push players to think more critically about the Cyrodiil that we're fighting for. Another book that appears on Martin's desk in the second act is The Refugees, which is a history of refugees fleeing the Cameron Usurper. Tonally, it's dark, showing the human cost of Cyrodiil's many conflicts, and it deals with some pretty mature content. At Menkar Cameron's birth, one of the witnesses remembers his mother saying, He is coming. He is coming and he will bring death. He will destroy all. The book ends with the ominous final line, He told me the baby's name, Rosanya replied, Menkar. That not even his mother frames Cameron as a savior feels like yet another missed opportunity to break him out of the generic villain role. He could have been framed as the one to end these foolish wars. It could have been a way to make his violence seem more purposeful. Instead, we discover that he was born from evil and violence, which may make him a touch more sympathetic, but that's about it. This could be construed as imperial propaganda, but again, at no point in the game are we ever led to see these texts as anything but accurate. If we're never given any reason to challenge the little knowledge we're given, most players won't, simply because the story is not compelling enough to intrinsically motivate them to do so. Fortunately for the story, we're through the worst of it, and we give the Great Stone to Martin, and he tells us our next target, a Great Sigil Stone, only obtained from a Great Gate, which means letting the Mythic Dawn open one. It's in this moment that Martin, having earned this character development or not, truly embodies the role of Tamriel's Emperor, and our story moves into its third act.
After having spent the entirety of the second act reading and researching, only occasionally interacting with the blades and always being humble and deferential when doing so, it's here in the third act that Martin fully embodies the role of the Emperor. He's even donned Tiber Septim's old armor, which given what we know of his magic-centric combat style, seems to suggest that he's intensely aware of the power of the symbol of the Emperor. He knows that if he looks and sounds the part, that it matters more in this instance than actually feeling ready. Is he really a more effective warrior in heavy armor? Probably not. But he knows that the men and women of Cyrodiil are about to fight and die under his command, and they'll fight harder for a man in gleaming armor of Tiber Septim than they will for a mage in grey robes. To me, this is what makes Martin Septim, and it's something I wish we explored more in the second act. I wish we could see the catalyst for this transformation. From what little we're given, he seems to imply that the player is the reason he's ready to play his part. We've played ours, now it's his turn. But given how little we've interacted with him, it strains credulity that we've really played this large a part in his development. We've spent maybe 10 or 15 minutes with him. They have the pieces there to make this transition more human, more impactful. Remember, Joffrey is the man who took him away as a child, and the man who watched and protected his own father, likely watching Uriel Septim develop from a young man into an accomplished emperor. I wish there was a moment of Martin and Joffrey talking. Martin is a fundamentally curious man. I find it odd that he wouldn't try to learn more about his father's growth as emperor before he takes the throne himself. This could also be accomplished by adding books about previous emperors to the piles around his desk, but I think a conversation with Joffrey would have fleshed both their characters out in an interesting way. The two of them having a heart-to-heart -heart the night before the Battle of Bruma, including a moment where Joffrey humanizes Uriel, emphasizing to Martin that being an emperor is impossibly difficult, would have been a really powerful moment in this story. A conversation where Joffrey acknowledges the burden of leadership, and maybe advises that just being as capital G good as you can while looking the part is all anyone can really do, that kind of tenderness, or at the very least that exchange of wisdom, would make Joffrey's coming death in the battle for Bruma hit all the harder. It is possible for Joffrey to survive, but narratively I think it functions better if he does sacrifice himself here in this desperate play for the amulet. So Martin Septim, only days after he rescued the cynical brother from the chapel of Akatosh, now looks and sounds the part of the emperor, and we proceed down to Bruma to talk the countess into supporting his plan. She's supportive, and agrees to meet Martin in the chapel of Talos. I like this moment from Martin. There's a calculation to it that the game never reflects on, but that works for me nonetheless. Martin knows what he's asking is a lot, but he's probably also aware that being a Septim descendant clad in the armor of Talos himself, standing in a chapel dedicated to his ancestor makes for a powerful image, and a difficult man to refuse. The Countess is supportive, however, and Martin lauds her for it. You have a rare gift to know when desperation is the path of wisdom. Not only does this line just feel very Tolkien-esque, but it's notable that the path of wisdom is the path that Martin seems to be using as a guide. He doesn't make an appeal to strength, again a crude comparison because Martin isn't a racist narcissist, but if it were Ulfric in this situation we'd have a bombastic monologue about unleashing the true strength of the Nords and the enemy not knowing what's about to hit them. Instead, Martin is much more kingly here. You can assemble guardsmen from all across Cyrodiil to aid in this fight as long as you've helped close the Oblivion Gates outside of their home cities. When you request aid from High Chancellor Okado in the Imperial Palace, he says he can't pull troops out of the provinces, otherwise there would be a political meltdown. Besides, I'd have a full-scale political crisis on my hands if I tried to pull any troops out of the provinces. I think on other playthroughs, I either glossed over that line or never bothered talking to him, but think through the implications. He's all but admitting that the Empire is an occupying force, and that to remove a military presence would mean the local people's rebellion. It's easy to look back at Oblivion with the added lore and perspective of Skyrim and scrutinize the Empire, but even in this game we're getting indicators that things in the Empire were darker than they seemed. Additionally, the fact that you rally support from the local counties without the Empire, and that it actually works, is subverting the monarchical structure of the Empire. In a way, the Oblivion Crisis succeeds in bringing down the Empire, not explicitly obviously, but by ending its storied line of emperors and showing the modern Empire for what it is a hollow symbol. In Skyrim, we learn it's here that the Thalmor begin their rise to power, so thanks for that, Mankar Cameron. On the subject of the Guardsmen sent to aid Bruma, I thought it was a clever moment of storytelling that the Count of Breville only sends his captain of the guard to help defend the city. If you run into her before she's sent off to Bruma, however, she's openly critical of the Count. 
The Count used to be a great man, but power and idleness have spoiled him. It's such a little moment, but I love the implication that this may have been a political move by the Count to try to kill off a powerful detractor. In my playthrough, it worked. The battle for Bruma is like every other combat encounter in Oblivion. It quickly turns into a sloppy hack and slash before you leap into the Great Gate. I like the timer mechanic on this one, adding a sense of urgency, but they give you way too much time. Most characters will be able to shut this gate with over 10 minutes to spare, so the narrative weight of this moment is let down a bit by the gameplay. This is the last Oblivion gate most players are going to shut, and while it looks daunting, it doesn't really feel any different. Going through this with Boris or Joffrey and having them die in a more deliberately sacrificial fashion might have given this moment the weight it seemed like it was going for. While it underwhelms a bit in the moment, the aftermath of the siege engine just rotting atop the snowy landscape is a great visual, especially with the strew of dead bodies around it. I passed it when I was traveling to the Imperial City with Martin after retrieving the Amulet of Kings, and it was a surprisingly somber moment. Martin doesn't acknowledge how many people have just died for his plan, which can be read as a little dark, but I chalked it up to oblivion jank. It's possible that most people are able to keep the casualties to a minimum. The return to Cloud Ruler Temple is a little somber, but there's no time to mourn. It's off to Minkar Cameron's paradise to finally, finally retrieve the Amulet of Kings. Before we set off though, I want to briefly discuss the amulet itself, our chief MacGuffin and award winner for the most creatively named trinket in a fantasy game. On a whim, I read the Amulet of Kings book that Martin had on his desk, but this entire section caught my eye. So as long as the Empire shall maintain its worship of Akatosh and his kin, and so as long as Elysia's heirs shall bear the Amulet of Kings, Akatosh and his divine kin maintain a strong barrier between Tamriel and Oblivion, so that mortal man need never again fear the devastating summoned hosts of the Deja Lords. But if the Empire should slacken in its dedication to the Nine Divines, or if the blood of Elysia's heirs should fail, then shall the barriers between Tamriel and the Daedric Realms fall, and the Daedra worshippers might summon lesser Daedra and undead spirits to trouble the races of men. So I just want to slow down and actually consider the implications of this. Yes, the amulet is figuratively a symbol of kingship, it's in the name, but it's also literally a mechanism for the maintenance of the monarchy. The protection of the Amulet of Kings and the Dragonfires is contingent on the, quote, blood of Elysia's heirs, so through that lens, it's almost equivalent to a doomsday device. The Empire is occupying lands well outside of Cyrodiil, and I'm sure the Emperor would have had political opponents within Cyrodiil as well. But because of the nature of the Amulet, the Septim Dynasty is likely seen as untouchable, or their killers would risk bringing down the walls of reality. This knowledge is widespread, the book on the Amulet of Kings can be found in many places, so it's not like this is a secret. And why should it be? It behooves the Septims to be seen as special and necessary for the survival of the world. I wish we would have gotten more on this, especially from Mankar Cameron, because it's possible Mankar thought he was just calling the Septims bluff. I find this little bit of lore darkly fascinating, and it makes Martin's destruction of the Amulet all the more symbolic. Not only are we literally ending the Septim Dynasty and pushing Dagon out of Tamriel, but we're ending a stifling era and reopening possibilities for the world to find itself. It's a rebirth for Tamriel, a chance for it to... Oh. Oh, oh none of that's going to happen? Okay, darker forces are going to pounce on the power vacuum and Septim Imperialism will be replaced with an even more stifling rule? Oh, okay, okay. Great work, everyone. Cameron's paradise feels like one when you first arrive, a lush realm of blues and greens that couldn't be further from the fiery reds of oblivion. His followers run in the grass as naked as oblivion lets its characters get without some very naughty mods, though immediately we can see that something doesn't feel right. They're chased by the same daedroth we've mindlessly purged while clearing oblivion gates, and when you talk to them they say, Are you here to end this nightmare and free us all from the savage garden? We push forward, with Cameron monologuing at the player, something I'll touch on more explicitly in a moment. There are two moments from Paradise I want to talk about before pivoting to Cameron, and one is the lava pit levers. There's something very disturbing about the fact that one person must always be suffering in the lava. While part of this builds into the imagery of the Forge, Cameron and Dagon are allegedly shaping the leaders of their new world, it's also powerful symbolism to the current climate of Cyrodiil. For everyone that's living comfortably, someone else is usually suffering, and that that extends all the way to Cameron's paradise is interesting to me. It's more proof that Cameron's new society will have the same problem as the Septims. 
The other element of Cameron's paradise that feels especially noteworthy is Eldamil, one of Cameron's higher-ups in the Mythic Dawn, who now sees you as his chance at redemption. He has a line about the people of Kovach that's a little piece of what I wish we got more of from the Mythic Dawn. Desperately, they seem to think this decadent, mundane world of theirs was worth defending. Decadent is the word that sticks out to me there, especially because I've hit on class divisions so much when discussing the Mythic Dawn. Aside from the little detail of the poorer styles of clothing in Gerald's house in Bruma, Eldamil's use of decadent is one of the only times the main questline gestures towards class. Eldamil redeems himself, helping you cross through to where Mankar and his children are waiting, even eagerly joining you in the fight against him. So now, on the cusp of his little throne room, it's time to talk about Mankar Cameron, the mustache-twirling simp of Mayrune's Dagon. Mangar Cameron falls so flat as a villain that I'm guessing even those of us who played Oblivion had likely forgotten who he was. He's the leader of the Mythic Dawn and the mind behind the Oblivion Crisis, and yet as players we never truly understand his motivations. Compelling villains have grounded and understandable motivations, mature philosophies and ambitions that organically clash with the protagonist. Evil for evil's sake is almost never a compelling thing to watch. I don't think anyone plays Doom for the plot. There are rare exceptions found in the rank of the truly psychotic, but building that gruesome charisma requires exceptional acting and an amount of screen time that the Elder Scrolls series has never dedicated to its villains. Instead, Cameron isn't really introduced until the game's second act, and our first real exposure to Cameron or his philosophy is through his commentaries we acquire as part of our hunt for the Amulet of Kings. These commentaries, allegedly written by Cameron himself, come across as fairly incoherent rantings in which a message is hidden on how to find the headquarters for the Mythic Dawn. On previous playthroughs of Oblivion, I don't think I had ever stopped to actually read these commentary volumes. I was never intrinsically motivated to explore Cameron's philosophy, in part because Oblivion's reliance on familiar images of the evil of hooded assassins and a mortar-esque realm of darkness never piqued my curiosity enough to delve further. There are times when Oblivion benefits from its reliance on these tropes. Despite an underlying darkness, there remains a familiar comfort to the world of Cyrodiil, and as time passes, it begets nostalgia in a way that's difficult to describe. This is why I think it would have been so important for Cameron to be developed in an interesting way in the actual main quest of the game, rather than bellowing a monologue in the penultimate quest that won't mean anything to the majority of players. It is up to Cameron to make the player think to develop and defend our visions of Cyrodiil in opposition to his. It's why in The Lord of the Rings, Oblivion's obvious inspiration gives us Saruman as a more engageable depiction of evil than Sauron. In his betrayal of Gandalf, Saruman says, There is no hope left in elves or dying Numenor. This, then, is the one choice before you, before us. We may join with that power. It would be wise, Gandalf. There is hope that way. Its victory is at hand, and there will be rich reward for those that aided it. When a rational, empowered mind chooses evil because they believe it's the best option, it's all the more heroic when characters still choose to defy it. Another way the monotonous evil of Sauron himself is enhanced is through the direct effect of the Ring on Frodo and the omnipresent tension of Gollum. Oblivion supplements Mehrun's Dagon with nothing. We get Cameron, whose commentaries include occasional references to the downtrodden and vague allusions to the creation of a paradise. This could have still worked if Cameron's paradise wasn't revealed to be a false one within minutes of our entering it. Instead, his own followers are in a state of perpetual suffering, and instead of appearing as a dark yet understandable alternative to the corrupt imperial world, he just appears like a mustache-twirling henchman for an even more dull, chaotic deity. Don't get me wrong, that can still function when the evil is already in power. In the original Star Wars, Darth Vader functions as a one-dimensional villain because he's working to uphold the fascist status quo. He's a dark warrior fighting for the same people that killed Luke's guardians. That alone is enough. When evil is the subverting force, as Cameron and his mythic Dawn are, then I think they suffer from dwelling in these dull vagaries. It's in Cameron's commentaries that Oblivion draws the most explicit attention to what I think is its most compelling idea, though it's not one that I think it ever allows itself to fully explore. I have a lot more to say on this later, but for now I do want to give a crumb of credit where it's due. Cameron's commentaries are one of the few things in Cyrodiil that seem to openly acknowledge the oppression of its people. The commentaries, and later the Mythic Dawn themselves, seem welcoming to anyone and point towards a more equitable world. 
In book one, he writes, We mortals leave the dreaming sleeve of birth the same, unmantled save for the symbiosis with our mothers, which is a sentiment that could appeal to those born with nothing, forced to live under a feudalistic imperial structure. Later in this first book, there's another pair of lines. Perhaps you came to us through war, or study, or shadow, or the alignment of certain snakes. Though each path matters in its kind, the prize is always thus. Welcome, Navachet. That you are here at all means that you have the worthiness of kings. This last line, the worthiness of kings, could be read as interesting foreshadowing to his false paradise. The first act we can attribute to Cameron is the assassination of the emperor. So for him to say his followers have the worthiness of kings is like me saying your favorite video game is as good as Destiny 2 Lightfall. To Cameron, kings are worthless, seemingly no different than the commoners over which they rule. This is also backed up in an interesting way. Cameron can wear the amulet of kings. I don't believe we get a clear answer why that's the case, and I'm okay with it being left a bit of a mystery. But I like the reading that his will and his personal power is enough to overcome whatever magic the amulet uses to try to limit its wares to only the septums. Circling back to Cameron's writings, there is a deceptive warmth to them, and it's not difficult to see how he may have attracted a following over the years. Frustratingly, what his writings don't describe is what his new world will look like. Cameron calls his paradise a vision of the past and the future. In a way, he's right, an idyllic landscape with an undercurrent of exploitation and darkness? Where have we seen this before? He further justifies the oblivion invasion by fashioning Dagon as a liberator, but again, because this paradise is so immediately and needlessly hellish for everyone except Cameron and his children, it's difficult to take this as anything other than the rantings of a madman. Here, in this penultimate moment, Instead of prompting the player to reflect on if and why this world might deserve a cleansing fire, he instead rants about the divines. How is it that the Daedra forthrightly proclaim themselves to man, while the gods cower behind statues and the faithless words of traitor priests? It is simple. They are not gods at all. The truth has been in front of you since you first were born. The Daedra are the true gods of this universe. This passage is delivered with the airs of an earth-shattering revelation, but none of the actual weight of one. I think the narrative failure of this moment is connected to two things. Firstly, we have in-game evidence that the gods don't cower behind statues. Though this is even more explicit in the Knights of the Nine storyline, the gods have had a direct impact on gameplay by curing diseases, granting boons, and passing both judgment and forgiveness onto the player. This could have been a much more powerful narrative moment if through Oblivion our interactions with the Elders of the Nine did nothing, or if their boons could be ambiguously attributed to a placebo or a character experiencing a boost in morale. Instead, we're given explicit confirmation that the gods exist, at least in some form, so atheism or even agnosticism in Cyrodiil feels illogical. It is Tamriel, the realm of change, brother to madness, sister to deceit. Your false gods could not entirely rewrite history. Thus you remember tales of Lorcan vilified, a dead trickster whose heart came to Tamria. But if a god can die, how does his heart survive? He is Daedroth! Tamriel I Daedroth! The average Oblivion player likely has no idea who Lorcan is or why this might matter. I certainly didn't, and the game to this point hasn't bothered to flesh out that legend within the quest lines of the game. Replacing one of the tedious second act fetch quests with an exploration of a ruin or a temple that explored the legend of Lorcan might have made this moment land, but instead it's essentially the soundtrack to your slaughter. The one thing that could have salvaged this monologue as is, is this allusion to the they. In Cameron's monologue, the default interpretation is that he's referring to the divines, that they're basking in the unearned worship, false idols content to sit back and watch this realm of existence sink into corruption and despair. There is a much more interesting interpretation of that line, though, one that actually plays on the themes of modern Cyrodiil. There is a different they at work that would have had a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. The imperial hegemony benefits from the world as it stands. Their work to hide the true nature of the gods would be a mature and realistic concept with which to grapple, but Oblivion doesn't even try to make that point. 
Instead, Cameron quickly pivots to lines about Lorcan, a character at least half of you have probably never heard of, but whose significance to the Elder Scrolls lore is impossible to overstate. To oversimplify way, way too much, Lorcan tricked his fellow gods into creating the mortal plane. He was later punished, and they kind of killed him, but it's a bit more complicated than that. In the in-game book, The Lunar Lorcan, we can find this passage. Lorcan's was cracked asunder, and his divine spark fell to Nurn as a shooting star, to impregnate it with the measure of its existence and a reasonable amount of selfishness. At first, it seems like Lorcan is only cited here as evidence for Cameron's theory about the Daedra being the true gods of Tamriel. And because this is oblivion, we've not been prompted nor incentivized to look into it beyond that. But this strange and sudden highlighting of Lorcan during the game's climax does lend credence to what ended up being one of the more coherent themes of oblivion. Multiplicity. But first, let's wrap up Oblivion's main quest as we return to Cyrodiil with the Amulet of Kings. We left Cloud Ruler Temple just after midnight and got to the outskirts of Imperial City just before dawn. There was something calming about descending from the mountains with Martin, the massive gray tower of Imperial City drawing closer as the night wore on. It's another time I wish there was some optional dialogue. For as much inspiration as Oblivion clearly takes from Lord of the Rings, it feels like such a missed opportunity that players don't learn more about Martin on a journey like this. These moving conversations can feel so special and organic, as games like Red Dead Redemption 2 have shown, and even Oblivion's successor Skyrim, but obviously Oblivion was limited by its stationary dialogue system. Still, we never really understand what seeing the Imperial City means to Martin. Even just a comment or two about seeing the city in a new light, or his thoughts of what it means to be Emperor, or even just recounting a memory from his youth. Anything might have made this moment feel more like the calm before the storm that I think it's meant to be. Upon arriving at the palace, Chancellor Okado immediately bends the knee to Martin, saying that the council has already considered his claim and has accepted it. Before Okado finishes his speech, however, a guard interrupts with news that the Daedra are launching a full-fledged invasion on the city, and that they've already breached the walls. Okado's response to this is, Your Highness, what are your orders? Shall the guard fall back to the palace? This moment isn't breaking any news to anyone, but I just want to note that it's consistent all the way through the game's climax. The guard is here to protect the Emperor and the other powerful people of the Imperial City, not the actual citizens that live here. That Okado's first suggestion to an invasion of the city was have the guard fall back to the palace is a little dark. Instead, Martin orders that everyone fight their way to the Temple of the One so that he can relight the dragon fires. This battle works better for me than the battle for Bruma. It feels more like the fight against impossible odds that the Oblivion Crisis is supposed to symbolize. To return to our Lord of the Rings comparison, this feels like a battle at the Black Gate. A desperate, dangerous, and possibly suicidal move all to buy time for people to get a magic artifact where it's supposed to go. Instead, Oblivion subverts that concept at the last minute. They're too late. Mayrun's Dagon has already arrived. What bothers me about this moment is that it feels wasted and almost random. Why only now does Mayrun's Dagon bother to show up? Gates have been opened across Cyrodiil for weeks to months at this point. Why now were the barriers suddenly weak enough to allow him to cross? Having to ride around this problem could have given Mangar much more to do. Both Cameron and Dagon would be more compelling if, at some point in Cameron's paradise, he revealed to the player that he had been secretly holding off Dagon this whole time for his own personal power grab. Something along that line would have added much needed complexity to Cameron, and made Dagon's arrival in this climax seem less tedious. Tedious or not, however, Dagon is here, and all hope seems lost until Martin has an idea. As I said before, I like that Martin's final act of heroism is one of cleverness and wisdom, rather than outright strength. It really cements the kind of hero that he is. I just wish his work in the second act wasn't relegated to just being the quest giver, and that we got to see his wit in action for more than just this final sacrifice. Martin breaks the amulet, joining the blood of kings and gods, and somehow in the process becoming a kind of avatar for Akatosh, an act that allows them to push Mayrun's Dagon back into the realm of oblivion, and seal the lines forever. There are two elements of this sacrifice that tie nicely into the narrative, but like so many other ideas in Oblivion's main quest line, I wish we spent more time on them. There's nice poetry to Martin's final act as Emperor being the ultimate act of faith. To our knowledge, this was not something that had ever been done before. He's taken a huge risk, and betting that Akatosh will help drive Dagon back in their darkest hour. Martin's come a long way from the cynical priest we met in Act 1, 
and even from the agnostic, determined emperor just a day or so ago. Something happened in the moments between this speech here. I still don't know if there is a divine plan, but I've come to realize that it doesn't matter. And the version of Martin that sacrifices his life in a final act of faith, his letting go and letting God, if you will. Here again is where I wish we had more dialogue from Martin, just in general, but also on that final journey to the Imperial City. Walking through the picturesque land he's meant to rule, not knowing what awaits him in the city, it would have been a believable moment for him to rediscover his faith. Instead, we're left wondering. The other part of this sacrifice is much more interesting to me, because it's an interesting piece in the story Oblivion has been telling in the background all along. I do what I must do. I cannot stay to rebuild Tamriel. That task falls to others. Farewell. You've been a good friend in the short time that I've known you. Martin says, I cannot stay to rebuild Tamriel. At first, I think it's easy to read this line literally, that the Oblivion Crisis has left scars that the people will need to build back from. And yet, that's not really the case. The Temple of the One is damaged, but aside from that, the scars on the landscape of Cyrodiil are fairly light. With the gates closed, the dark and scaly ruins serve more as a reminder of the fading darkness rather than something to recover from. I think the other interpretation of this line is much more interesting and much more in line with the Tamriel that we've come to understand over the last few weeks. Tamriel and its empire are fundamentally broken. I wish we were able to talk with Martin about why he thought the Mythic Dawn could rise to power in the first place, why he thought so many people would be willing to fight and kill for a one-note Prince of Darkness. While this darker interpretation about rebuilding Tamriel is consistent with most of Oblivion's environmental storytelling, I think it's also the interpretation that Bethesda themselves ran with in the making of Skyrim. The clues are all here in Oblivion, puzzle pieces laid out to form an ominous picture. This is still a declining empire. Martin knew it, even though he still thought it was one worth dying for. The third age has ended, and a new age dawns. When the next Elder Scroll is written, you shall be its scribe. The shape of the future, the fate of the Empire. These things now belong to you. Like all mythic heroes, we've returned from our journey, but as changed individuals. There's a bitter sweetness to the quiet streets of Cyrodiil, to its hills and uncannily still waters. Martin thought this was a land worth dying for. Now Oblivion gives you all the time in the world to see if you agree. As a story, Oblivion almost works better in this kind of purgatory, with a world teetering on the edge of a knife. The player can go from town to town, working odd jobs and helping the people of the Empire when and where they can, but there's still a lingering discomfort that hangs over the land. Both of Oblivion's premier story DLCs address this discomfort in their own way, one through faith and one through madness. Each DLC feels like a fitting end to a different kind of player. It's that idea, that Oblivion was built for any kind of player, that has made this game difficult to critique. How should we judge the scripted content for a game that has knowingly deprioritized that scripted content? How do we analyze the journey of a hero that never truly makes a choice? I've tried to focus on areas where Oblivion could have told a story, through its scripted heroes and villains, through its main story dungeons, or ideas it could have connected more strongly. But now I want to stop and talk about the hero of Kavach, and whether or not the last minute curveball from Mankar Cameron can unite a multiverse of players into a believable champion of Cyrodiil. Well met. Good to see you. Throughout the making of this video, anytime I thought I was getting close to a cohesive and comprehensive analysis on our protagonist, one questline in particular kept undermining my conclusions, and it happens to be the one that many consider Oblivion's best, the Dark Brotherhood. Because for most of my work, it seemed that in both a narrative sense and a gameplay one, the world feels like it's built for two types of heroes. The chivalric, godly hero it wants, and the subversive, conniving anti-hero it deserves. Both these paths function extremely well in the narrative and can work as virtually different games. The paladin that risks it all to save Cyrodiil in the main quest, even though they started their journey behind bars. They help others, maybe join the Fighters or Mages Guild, and are rewarded for their work to uphold the status quo. 
the other, the anti-hero, the thief, swindler, assassin, that joins the thief's guild out of greed or rebellion. They earn infamy and coin in equal measure, maybe diving into a gate or two for the spoils, but could just as easily avoid them entirely. This analysis lined up beautifully with what I thought was Oblivion's purposeful duplicity. As either the shining hero or crafty anti-hero, you muster the courage and motivation to save the realm. Each playstyle could represent part of Cyrodiil. The hero, the champion of the ruling class, of the status quo, of stories and lordly halls and well-lit inns. The anti-hero may not look the part, but they get the job done and still help others when they can. They might feel more at home in the back streets of Breville or Leowen than the cobbled streets of Skingrad. Looking at Oblivion through this dichotomy allowed both pieces of DLC to feel like satisfying conclusions to the kind of story a player was trying to write for themselves. What better way for a classic hero to end their story than by serving as the humble champion for the literal gods resurrected at the final hour to continue a mission of service and justice? And for a more morally dubious anti-hero who is tired of fighting the chaos and selfishness of the world, is it not fitting to simply give up the search for coherence and meaning entirely? To accept that madness is the only thing you can probably count on in Cyrodiil, to try to relax and just have fun with the limited time they have. In his paradise, Mankar Cameron mentions Lorcan, a character that had gone previously unmentioned up to this point in the narrative. Lorcan was a trickster god responsible for the creation of the world, which is yet another area where the Elder Scrolls pulls from real-life imagery of myth to create a fantasy world that still feels deeply human and familiar. Lorcan, then, mirrors figures like the Greek Prometheus, or Northwest Native American mythology around the trickster Raven. Below is an excerpt from the Raven story published by Heda artist Bill Reed. As Raven flies away, Eagle sees him and tries to steal the light, causing Raven to drop some of it, which becomes the moon and the stars. It's pretty clear that the below text from the lunar Lorcan, found in both Oblivion and Skyrim, was heavily inspired by this kind of myth. I've continually mentioned how Oblivion's world is built around familiarity, and how that easy familiarity effectively enables nostalgia. It's a difficult thing to do, and it's a thing that's done in the details, like this little snippet of real-world myth being adapted. This excerpt from the Lorcan book is very similar to the Raven story. Lorcan's was cracked asunder, and his divine spark felt an urn as a shooting star, to impregnate it with a measure of its existence and a reasonable amount of selfishness. Slight tangent aside, it's the dichotomous parts of Lorcan lore that I want to scrutinize here because it feels significant that the entity responsible for Tamriel's creation embodies a moral complexity that the player character and Martin will go on to share. Because if you have way, way too much time on your hands and you go chasing these tiny details, get out the red yarn, and really, really squint, you could make an argument that Oblivion's two heroes, you and Martin, represent a morally gray dichotomy that still chooses some form of heroism, and thus the world is saved in a manner similar to its creation. But that's not really in the text of the game, unfortunately. It's difficult to credit the game for the fact that technically anyone can save the world, because it's a message that hardly feels deliberate. In Oblivion, anyone can do anything. The fact that you can be a known mass murderer and Martin and the Blade still shelter and empower you as their chief errand boy feels more like a bug than a feature. In interviews, Todd Howard has said that, quote, the world ultimately becomes the main character of our games. And it's an understandable creative move. Centering the world rather than the protagonist within it can maintain player freedom while creating a world compelling enough for players to create their own stories. But that's not what Cyrodiil is. Cyrodiil's fixation on total freedom for the player dooms it to feel like a playground rather than a world. And while there are gameplay reasons to support that philosophy, it's impossible to deny that the narrative suffers as a result. Oblivion would be a better game if actions had consequences, because it's the fallout from our actions that give them a believable weight. Nothing has weight in Oblivion. The only freedom you have in the scripted content is the choice of whether or not to engage with it. Again, there are rational explanations for how one might believably engage in the Fighter's Guild, Mage's Guild, or even the Thieves Guild all in one playthrough. As I've touched on, the world of Cyrodiil is fundamentally flawed. The Thieves' Guild sticking up for beggars and stealing in order to do so can be seen as a morally justified stance. Heroic characters can ascend to lead all three factions without straining the credulity of the story too much. But then we get to the Dark Brotherhood. It might become more obvious the more I talk about it, but as someone who likes to play fundamentally good characters in these kinds of games, I don't really like the Dark Brotherhood in Oblivion, and one of Skyrim's many improvements was the ability to exterminate the secret guild as soon as you stumble across them. 
I also understand that it's probably Oblivion's most fun and memorable questline, but to access it without breaking immersion, I usually feel required to create a new, more evil character. Immersion is the operative word there. Without pushback from the game, players must regulate their own immersion. Players must be the one to put constraints on their characters because the game will never do that. And still, that might be fine if every other character in this game didn't also feel like they were only there for the player's amusement. Oblivion is heralded as the game that introduced some of the most realistic NPCs and NPC schedules in gaming at the time. Much of the academic scholarship around this game revolves around analyzing how they did this, what it means for the game, and what it means to be considered sentient. Fascinating stuff that I am much too dim to thoughtfully engage with here. The issue is that despite their creative schedules and realistic life patterns, most NPCs still feel the same. Part of that is the voice acting, where so many people share a voice. But another issue is the writing. I don't think any NPCs are ever given any chance to share a worldview or thoughtfully reflect on Cyrodiil in any meaningful way. So both the world and the people in it start to feel like they're only there for the player, which further burdens roleplay. This is a huge issue in the main quest. Martin calls us his friend many times in the second and third act, even citing the player as the reason for his restored faith and sudden courage. And yet as players, we spend maybe five to seven minutes total in any actual dialogue with him. So yes, you can and probably should put constraints on your character yourself through internal roleplay. But from an analysis perspective, because the game doesn't, I feel that an honest critique must analyze it through that be anyone do anything lens. So if anyone can be the champion of Cyrodiil, if anyone can be leader of all major guilds, become the divine crusader of the Nine, and ultimately inherit the role of the god of madness, what does that mean? My original search for answers had me defaulting to chronology. Shivering Isles was the final expansion for Oblivion, so perhaps we're meant to view it as its conclusion. Both the main quest and the world of Shivering Isles seem to argue that to look at the world through a lens of good and evil is inherently absurd. Instead, embracing absurdity itself is the final evolution. That this is the only argument that Oblivion seems to loudly and emphatically deliver is disappointing, both narratively and philosophically. Not only is it the grumbled worldview of 14-year-old boys with Joker avatars, but it's unsupported by the stories and world in its own game. The core game of Oblivion seems to be indicating that heroes really can come from anywhere, and if we remove the Dark Brotherhood from the equation, you can complete all the side content and as a player still fit in with this general theme. We see this idea with Martin, a bastard that used to dabble in dark magics, who tried to find his faith and redemption in the quiet life of a monk, only to have that tested by the Oblivion Crisis. One of my favorite side quests that embodies this idea is that of Mazoga the Orc in Leowin. She's bossy and impatient, and it turns out that she's a former bandit on a quest for vengeance. She claims to be a knight, a claim that gains her the scrutiny of the Leowin locals, including the Count. If you help her get revenge on a bandit from her past, she reveals that she's a knight because she just decided to be. You can tell this to the Count of Leowin, who gives you both a chance to become formally knighted by him if you successfully hunt down a local bandit in the area. The two of you do, and you're both named Knights of the White Stallion. In her goodbye to the player, she says this line, which I really enjoy. So I better get started doing my good deeds. Mzoga is a hero because she wants to be. Mzoga knighted herself, acted the part, and in a self-fulfilling prophecy became a knight. Mzoga sets off to do good deeds because she knows that's what knights do. Because that's what heroes do. Mzoga is one of the few characters that seems to transcend her given role. Like the player, she's able to become whatever she wants, through nothing other than simply deciding that she wants to be something new. In Oblivion, characters react to this with suspicion and distrust, but when we do it, no one bats an eye because the game world is written for us in a way that it isn't written for Mazoga. Oblivion would have been a better and more grounded player experience if we experienced the same kind of social consequences as a character like Mazoga for our actions. A strange man running around town in gleaming armor, asking about rumors and leaping in the air every other step should prompt suspicion and doubt. Instead, everything is so seamlessly built for the player to do whatever they want, however they want. Nevertheless, we have to look at the world as it is presented to us, a presentation comprised of both scripted and unscripted content, and I think we're left with three possible conclusions as to what Oblivion might be trying to say about heroes. Oblivion is trying to say nothing. Oblivion is gleefully saying that anyone can be anything. An infamous murderer can be the hailed champion of Cyrodiil. A virtuous character can be the grand champion of a lethal arena system that preys on the poor without compromising their ethics. 
the gods can and will choose anyone to be their champion. The third option is that Oblivion rejects meaning and heroism intentionally, and gestures vaguely towards madness being the inevitable end for any player character who lives in this world long enough. These are the three interpretations that I can think of that encompass all of Oblivion's quest and playstyle options, and I find all of these conclusions to be a little disappointing. For Oblivion to hold up to narrative scrutiny, we need to treat the player character as an observer rather than a protagonist, and treat their game experience as an amusement park ride rather than a fantasy journey. When we remove the player character, most of Oblivion falls into place. Martin is a complex hero with a dark past that overcomes his anxiety and lack of faith, relying on his wisdom and cleverness to win the day. If we were given more time with him, he could flourish in that discount Aragorn role, the wise king with a bit of dirt on his robes. Joffrey, a world-weary mentor ready to sacrifice it all in one last battle. Boris is a guilt-wracked rookie recklessly seeking redemption for something he was powerless to stop. Mangar had such potential as a villain, though he, like everyone else in this game, is so underdeveloped. This idea of player as spectator rather than protagonist would excuse or explain Oblivion's lack of agency for the player in its main quest, but it's then difficult to overlook that we're still not given compelling characters, only the preliminary sketches of them. Oblivion wants to beat the familiar fantasy drum, but at every turn seems to lose the rhythm, so quickly bored of its own sound and hurling the player off to another dungeon. The only idea that Oblivion seems to push, predominantly through its environmental storytelling, is the lightest, lightest form of class commentary. Have pity, sir. I got nothing to eat. Any intellectually honest critique of Oblivion has to touch on the political angles of the game. There's no apolitical path in a fantasy of this scale. A world this big will raise questions you have to be prepared to have answers for. Oblivion's world is complex and full enough to raise questions, it's just refusing to answer them with anything interesting. I think the most obvious example is the presence of beggars in every single town or city. When you add beggars in an attempt to make your fantasy world feel more realistic, you've now, whether intentionally or not, created communities and a government that clearly have the resources to do something about this problem, yet still allow people to remain at these levels of poverty. This may be less of an issue in highly decentralized tribal governments like the ones we'll see in Skyrim, but in Oblivion it begs the question, what good was the Septim Empire if it allowed its people to live like this? This is the empire that the player character is fighting to defend. We're blindly supporting another Septim heir to the throne, without ever having the opportunity to question if that's even the best course of action. Yet to my knowledge, no one in Oblivion ever brings this up. It's briefly touched on in an early mission with the Thieves' Guild, and then not really seriously addressed after that. The people of the waterfront are very poor. Traditionally, the city has not collected taxes from them, even though by law they could. The money the city would collect would barely cover the cost of collecting. It's also hard to ignore this issue when it comes to Oblivion's overt reliance on Judeo-Christian imagery. Its tall, gothic chapels for the Nine Divines and quaint priories evoke Christianity, and Mehrunes Dagon and his realm are obviously feeding off Judeo-Christian symbols for hell, both visually and nominatively. We know at least two of the gods would encourage some form of charity towards beggars and the poor. Mara is the goddess of love and compassion. Stendar is a god of mercy, justice, and charity. So again, with Cyrodiil being a land filled with alleged believers, massive chapels in every town, why are these people not more adequately housed and cared for? I think that this is an oversight, or hand waved away because beggars play a pivotal gameplay role for the Thieves' Guild, but there's also an explicit quest from a priestess from the Temple of the One that deals with this. She's the master trainer for speechcraft, and before she'll accept you as a pupil, she says, you would seek to better yourself. First, I would ask that you look to the poor and the suffering around Cyrodiil. Travel to all of our cities and speak with the unfortunate souls forced to beg for change. Look into their hearts and then look into your own. If you actually do this, I think there's 19 or 20 beggars total, again, just speak to them, nothing else. If you do this and return to her, she'll say, You have seen the beggars. You have, I hope, used your powers of speech to raise their spirits. Now I can help you improve those powers to help make lives better. This 
is a mission by a priestess in the imperial city, implied to be the wealthiest city in Cyrodiil, and this is her solution. We have deigned to acknowledge the beggars, maybe even told them a boast or a joke, and ta-da, that's our good deed for the day. There's no, hey, give them this information, direct them to the giant chapel in their town, or even just bring these sacks of food, I know it's not much, but it's what I can do now. There's none of that. Instead, it's just, hey, where does the king keep his armies? In his sleeves. Sweet, that's you done. Where are the other pores at? I don't see any other way to read this quest other than as a confirmation that the Church of Cyrodiil is woefully out of touch. So if the church doesn't do anything to help the poor, and the empire certainly doesn't seem to care, to whom do they turn next? In Oblivion, the beggars' involvement with the Thieves' Guild implies that they may be receiving aid from them. I've also noted how the mythic Dawn seems to be primarily composed of lower-class individuals, and how that kind of instant brotherhood and camaraderie would appeal to someone who otherwise feels powerless. And it's that powerlessness that I think is key to center here. Because when we're analyzing the economics of Cyrodiil, it's impossible to overlook the fact that power is currency. There's gold in every hill, loot for the taking in the wilds. Cyrodiil's economy is built, maybe not around violence, but certainly built to accommodate and enhance it. Being an adventurer is a profession, though not one everyone survives. The strong live to tell the tale, to return with glory and wealth. The weak, or the unlucky, die in the attempt, their bodies left to rot for the next adventurer. Apathy to the poor to this extent is usually an attitude cultivated or encouraged from the top down, so I can't help but wonder if this is how the beggars of Cyrodiil are treated simply because, in theory, if they wanted to leave the safe walls of the city and try to find wealth, they could. This could have been a compelling issue to grapple with, to have articulated and countered because of how eternally relevant it is to our own world, and yet it's untouched. It's also noticeable that Breville, Oblivion's most racially diverse city, is also its poorest, and many in the town live with an addiction to skooma. The Count's son is also an addict, and that seems to be the reason why none of the guardsmen seem to mind the open consumption of skooma in the city. The Count himself was a bit of an ass, too. One of his lines in particular stuck out. Are you a foreigner? Do yourself a favor. Learn the basics about the places you visit. <laughs> there. Problem solved. Here again, Oblivion is alluding to serious tensions around race and class without actually thoughtfully engaging with these subjects. There's no opportunity for your character to tell him off or ask how or why he has this perspective. Instead, Oblivion lets its world do the talking, and it really doesn't say much. Throughout my comments on the main quest, one of my constant critiques was how shallow Oblivion's characters feel. It's not just that they're torn right from monomythic and narrative tropes, it's that they're done so in the shallowest way. 2009's Dragon Age Origins is a game that revels in these tropes, but turns around and does something interesting with them. Without spoiling that game for those who haven't played it, every character you meet feels pulled from a list of fantasy tropes, but almost every character ends up subverting that by the time you finish the game and it's often a result of your character's interaction with them. Another Bioware game, Mass Effect, is chock full of tropey characters, and yet they're so patiently fleshed out over the game's runtime that to this day, over 16 years later, people still remember these characters fondly. Bethesda's RPGs are fundamentally different from their more linear Bioware counterparts. I don't think it's fair to compare things like plot or pacing, but the majority of character development and bonding that occurs in these games occurs through dialogue. In Knights of the Old Republic games, you speak with your squad mates on your ship, the Ebon Hawk. In Mass Effect, it's the Normandy, Dragon Age, your camp, or your base. These aren't expensive or complex pieces of cinematics, they're just conversations with the people around you. In talking about their pasts, regrets, futures, ideas, they feel grounded in the world and also make the player feel more a part of it. Because these conversations aren't just about learning more about the characters around the player, they're pivotal for the player to help define themselves as well. It sounds so obvious that I feel ridiculous even having to say this, but when a character tells you something about themselves and you get to pick from multiple responses to reply, both the character and the player benefit. There are so many games that do this well, and then there's Oblivion. The fact that your player character never significantly engages on any topic in Cyrodiil makes them feel like less the hero of Kavach and more cardboard cutout with a moving camera. For example, if you swing into the offices of the Black Horse Courier in the market district of the Imperial City, you can have a chat with one of the Khajiit brothers who runs it. He says, 
Others write. We organize. We deliver. The news never stops. There's no specific prompt to get him to elaborate, but if you click the Imperial City subject, he does, and he says the following. The Black Horse Courier brings the news of the people to the people. We are funded by the Empire, so our broadsheets are always free. That's where the conversation ends. You can poke him to get a random rumor, but there's no way for the player to engage with the information they were just given. The only newspaper in Cyrodiil is funded by the Empire. Most characters, whether you're playing them as good or more evil, might want to have a conversation about that. Isn't it a problem that the Empire funds and controls the people's main journalistic outlet? How much oversight do they have? Why isn't there more competition? Because, to be clear, there isn't more competition. One of the citizens in the market district had this to say. Good thing we have the Black Horse Courier. I don't know how we'd get our news without it. You can't ask any of these questions in-game, and without having the option to engage further in conversation, I think most players will quickly click out of this conversation and find other dialogue prompts that lead to quests or viable rumors. I was curious, though, and poked around at all the old copies of the courier that were strewn about his desk. One edition talked about Night Mother rituals and the growing threat of the Dark Brotherhood, and featured a quote from an Imperial spokesman that said the following, The Imperial Legion exists for one reason, and one reason only to protect and serve the people of Tamriel. Later in the piece, it says, From this point forward, any citizen found in the possession of items related to the Night Mother ritual will be incarcerated in the Imperial prison indefinitely, and their property seized by the Empire. There's no fine high enough, no standard prison sentence long enough, for the type of malcontent who would show such a blatant disregard for our dear Emperor's laws and the welfare of the fine people of Tamriel. To be sure, Adamus Philida is not one to issue empty threats. Indeed, the Black Horse Courier has learned that one Claudius Arcadia, until recently a resident of the Talos Plaza district of the Imperial City, is now residing in a cold, dank cell in the Imperial prison, and his house has become the newest Imperial Legion outpost. This piece of propaganda is written by a woman who dubs herself Agnes, the quill is mightier than the ebony sword, Eardheart, which is a delicious bit of irony because the pen is only mightier than the sword if it's being wielded with intellectual and moral integrity. This is all excellent world building, and I love every part of it except the fact that the player isn't ever given an opportunity to engage within the game on this issue. It paints the Empire in a darker, more fascistic light, and like good fiction, connects to the issues in our contemporary world. Oblivion came out in 2006, in the midst of the Iraq War, and in a country still dealing with the trauma from 9-11 with counterterrorism and surveillance politics dominating the zeitgeist, forcing players to ask themselves what they are willing to sacrifice for security, or at least the illusion of security, could make this moment feel weightier. On a narrative level, just giving players the opportunity to thoughtfully engage with the owners of Black Horse Courier for a line or two about the ethics of this kind of journalism would at the very least help players define who their characters are in this playthrough. More virtuous characters might express some concern, more jaded ones might choose a snarky response about how at least it gives people something to read. Either way, characters would reflect on a subject and then pick a response that helps them to define themselves. I can't say this enough, although now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know if I've specifically articulated this at all. Oblivion is not a narratively disappointing game because it's a pretty world with dark imperialistic undercurrents. Oblivion is a narratively disappointing game because it's a dark, imperialistic world with seemingly no one in it having anything of consequence to say about it. That, too, might be excusable if the Empire was presented as being so domineering that citizens were simply too afraid to speak out. But again, that's not the story we're being told. To pick a more prominent example, let's look at this first conversation that you can have with Joffrey when you bring the amulet to him. The initial dialogue tree is no tree at all, just a railroaded set of responses that will be the same for every player, every playthrough. And it's a shame, because there are logical alternatives here. Having just witnessed shadowy assassins, savvy players might want Joffrey to first prove he is who he says he is. More roguish types may foolishly try to extort him, tell him to hand over some gold for their troubles before they hand over the amulet. Either way, it would have been interesting, and again, a way for the player character to define who they're going to be this playthrough. From there, every dialogue option for the player here is just a prompt for Joffrey to exposit at them. You can't respond to any of his comments, you can only choose whether or not to ask for them. 
This is one of the first real conversations of the main quest, with a character who will be a prominent ally for the rest of the game, and yet every player is going to have the exact same shallow interaction with Joffrey. He doesn't even seem sad that the Emperor is dead, nor does he sound so professional that the non-response would also seem plausible. Instead, he's a lifeless husk of exposition, immediately guessing that the unlit dragon fires are likely going to be a problem, and telling the player everything they need to know about Martin immediately. It all feels so rushed, tedious, and two-dimensional. Think of what the player has just been told. The Emperor had a bastard son. The blades don't respond to the government, only the Emperor. Martin was snuck away to be raised by others in secret, with Joffrey checking in on him from time to time. There's so many follow-up questions a character might want to ask, but Oblivion gives us no options to ask them. Compare this to one of the first dialogue exchanges in Fallout New Vegas, when Doc Mitchell gives the player a Pip-Boy and says, Ain't much use to me now, but you might want such a thing after what you've been through. I know what it's like having something taken from you. The game ends the dialogue there, and Doc Mitchell turns you loose on the world. But many curious players will have had their curiosity piqued. Who or what was taken from Doc Mitchell? And if you turn around right after that conversation ends, you can engage with him again, with one of the many options being asking him to tell you about himself. After listening to him, it gives you the option to say, you said before you had something taken from you. Not only does New Vegas allow you to circle back to a subject that piqued your interest, but it frames the asking of it in a realistic way. It's not a glowing yellow box that says taken. What's even more wonderful about this moment is that he doesn't really answer you. He says, Well, ain't we all, right? That was a long time ago. I don't pay it much mind anymore. It's a believable response from someone who still doesn't really know or trust the player character. It's wistful yet deflective, and further deepens the characterization of both Doc Mitchell and the player. I really didn't want to be one of those people, but from a dialogue perspective, there's more humanity and depth in the first conversation of Fallout New Vegas than anywhere in Oblivion. And while yes, New Vegas came out four years later than Oblivion, it only had a development cycle of 18 months, whereas Oblivion was in development from 2002, so around four years. Bioware's and Obsidian's Knights of the Old Republic games, both of which came out well before Oblivion, also had more robust and thoughtful dialogue trees. The purpose of comparison here is just to emphasize that Oblivion's lack of meaningful dialogue trees is a matter of prioritization, not technological limitation. Oblivion was extremely ambitious in so many ways, but it's difficult to ignore just how little time and attention went into dialogue. Does anyone really care that NPCs have friends, schedules, jobs, and needs if you can't remember a meaningful exchange with any of them? All the labor to make the world feel expansive and alive through the Radiant AI system is undermined when the vast majority of characters have the exact same thing to say when you talk to them. In hearing and reading about the shift in Bethesda design philosophy from the Arena Daggerfall days to the Morrowind Oblivion Skyrim era, one of the biggest changes was the switch from procedurally generated worlds to handcrafted ones. It's just a shame this philosophy didn't also apply to their character interactions. I don't really mind this for side characters. In a game like Oblivion, there are rational arguments to be made for prioritizing the feeling of populous cities over making sure every citizen feels three-dimensional. But even the major story characters are lifeless tools for quest delivery and exposition. The Witcher 3 doesn't let you stop and conversate with every NPC. Most of them just have a generic snarky line or two that they'll espouse when you engage with them. But to compensate, the conversations you do get to engage in are usually more meaningful and push the player to think more critically about the world and Geralt's role in it. I've already touched on how Mankar Cameron's underdevelopment undercuts the broader narrative experience, but the lack of any meaningful engagement with Oblivion's other characters adds to that sense of the world being a playground rather than a world. It's a level of shallowness that permeates and undermines almost everything in Oblivion. Which is a shame because there's so much Oblivion does well from a world and gameplay loop perspective. There are so many details like the Black Horse Courier that feel like they should prompt additional conversations, but we almost never have the option to engage. Even bigger story characters like Martin and Joffrey are left two-dimensional, cardboard cutouts of characters that might have been interesting if given the time. And as a result, the overall narrative and player immersion suffer. Bethesda has spent years simplifying their games, and to a degree it's worked. I think anyone can hardly recommend Skyrim or Fallout 4 to a new gamer, and they'll likely have a good time with those games. But that constant prioritization of simplicity and fun 
have come at the cost of narrative depth, which, for me at least, is what makes a world feel believable. What's left in these games when the novelty or nostalgia wear off? In Oblivion, Bethesda created a world that will be spellbinding on a first playthrough, but it's hard to ignore how quickly the enchantment wears off on subsequent journeys. That's not to say it's never effective. Oblivion thrives as a high fantasy western, where the player character engages with the world as a quasi-gunslinger, going from town to town in search of money and adventure, and leaving the cities and towns ever so slightly changed in your wake. Viewed through this lens, suddenly the social and intellectual loneliness inherent in Oblivion's dialogue systems and quest structure add to that feeling of a desolate frontier. In that kind of world, engagement with the intellectual and philosophical can conceivably be a distant aspiration, as the vast majority of people are focused on mere survival. However, this interpretation only functions successfully if the player shares that mentality. If the player doesn't, and wants to meaningfully engage with the world through dialogue or agency and quest design, then we're back to the issue of the only choice being whether or not you participate. If you do, though, and create a character with Oblivion's narrative constraints in mind, the game can shine under that new light, and it's easier to focus on what Oblivion can do well. And it's a lot. The world is fun to explore, and with a calibrated character backstory and narrative expectations, there's so many things Oblivion excels at. My second playthrough was as more of a rogue, and ignoring the main quest entirely, I set off from Imperial City and headed south towards Breville, slowly working my way through the dungeons on the way. After my first or second Aelid Ruin, when I found that I could shoot the Mounted Stones with arrows to knock them down and collect them, I started to actively seek out Aelid Ruins because of how lucrative they became. Every time I'd return to a town, my inventory was full of stones, and I quickly amassed a small fortune as a specialized dungeon diver. The shallow social system also works well for this kind of playthrough. I would go out of my way to sell my goods at a shop in Breville, aptly named The Fair Deal, because the shopkeeper there had a higher initial disposition to me, and the prices were better as a result. When you make a large transaction in Oblivion, merchant dispositions towards the player rise. So as I kept returning with my latest finds, the shopkeeper became even friendlier towards me, and as a result, she would buy my goods for even more. I took almost no notes during my second playthrough in Oblivion, because I routinely found myself too immersed by this world, too distracted by the next fort or ruin on the foggy horizon or my next financial milestone. It's back to that small yet Campbellian gameplay loop I mentioned earlier. We're in a place of comfort, but we want or need something, so we leave, venture into the wilderness, take risks, pay a price, learn hard lessons, and return changed and usually richer. Oblivion will enable you to play that story half a hundred times, and with how beautiful and engaging this world can be, you'll want to. One of the standout moments of this playthrough was my encountering a unicorn in the wild on my way to Breville. I killed the minotaurs around it, sheathed my bow, and tried to see if I could ride it. And I could. As the sun set in hues of pink and blue, I rode my gleaming steed southward towards my city of filth, until I spotted a pair of bandits on the road ahead. I dismounted, snuck off into the bushes, and engaged them from a distance, and my new mount, that would surely never betray me, helped me kill these insolent wretches. And then she turned her wrath onto me. Because in Oblivion, this unicorn, the only unicorn in the game, will attack you if you have your weapons drawn as you get near it. This is information I wish I would have known at the time. And so, unwilling to kill the last unicorn, I did what any hero would do. I ran. At the rickety bridge to Breville, I used the lone guard as a human shield, hoping he would kill the symbol of innocence and I'd be free to wander once again while he dealt with the emotional fallout of his unforgivable act. Unfortunately, I forgot it was the Breville Guard I was dealing with, a group exceeded in their uselessness only by the mysticism branch of the Mages Guild, so I had to deal with it myself. And I did. I lured it into a nearby stable pen and shut the door, trapping the grumpy unicorn inside. When it was clear he wouldn't escape, I went into the city and went about my business, and upon my exit a few hours later, the unicorn was now docile. I left it in the stables and proceeded to the Aelid Ruin south of the city, ready to make some money, but there was a small tent only a few dozen yards away, so I decided to try to sleep first, only to be woken by a ghostly figure staring out at the shore. I had stumbled onto one of Oblivion's side quests quite organically. I hadn't ever played this one before, though on my prior playthrough I remember hearing rumors about it in Breville. Having it start because you literally see the Forlorn Watchman felt surprisingly rewarding, and I tracked him through the hills and played out the side quest, 
looting a wrecked ship infested with ghosts, and tracking down some sunken treasure in the eastern swamps. Those moments happen back to back for me, and to me that's Oblivion's magic at its best. they are two very different kinds of stories, one unscripted, one scripted, yet both felt fun, meaningful, and personal. Both play well with Oblivion's narrative limitations. They didn't really involve any other characters, nor much of Oblivion's tedious dialogue, so it didn't feel like anything was missing. It was just a fun little sequence that reminded me how high the highs in this game can feel, especially with smaller, more serialized kinds of stories. You'd think I'd be sick of this game. I've spent countless hours reading about it, writing about it, and playing it, and yet I still keep coming back to that second character, wanting to hop on and roam the wild hills of Cyrodiil, making the most of my character's second chance, returning to my friendly shopkeeper in Breville as the two of us build a small fortune through my dungeon diving. And on this kind of playthrough, the loneliness built into every social interaction, the disassociation your player character experiences, these elements which corrode a proper playthrough and hamper the main questline feel right at home with a more outcast character that's just trying to make it in the world one day at a time. That doesn't redeem Oblivion's terrible narrative, but I wanted to highlight how good this game can be at times. It's not a bad game, but it could have been better, and that's what I can't stop thinking about. I love Oblivion. I still love Oblivion, but when I started this project, I thought I would have predominantly good things to say. I think I remember Oblivion as most of you do, for the great moments coming out of a dungeon and into the sun, the peaceful soundtrack kicking in as you gallop a stolen horse over the bridge outside of Imperial City, finding a ring or a weapon in a chest somewhere that makes you want to tell your friend or change the way you play the game. These things are still great. Oblivion is still great. But its grander stories aren't. When I think of Oblivion, I think of moments like my unicorn misadventure, or helping the old fisherman in Way kill slaughterfish and getting an insanely valuable ring as a reward. I think of helping the old old brothers defend their little farm, desperately trying to keep the goblin's aggression on myself rather than the boys. I think of a cave called Goblin Jim's Cave on the Gold Coast, where all the goblins had little yellow hands painted on their arms and Goblin Jim ended up being some nutcase with an invisibility spell that I accidentally killed before he said anything in his defense. Those little moments make Oblivion great, and have the power to imbue it with a meaning beyond its middling text. It's also difficult to ascribe narrative meaning to a game when players are already aware that meaning is secondary to fun. It's not truly a world, it's a playground. You can't lead a murder cult and selflessly save the realm because Oblivion wants to make a cohesive statement about how heroes can come from anywhere. You can do it because it's fun. And yet, Oblivion still could have said something in its narrative content, and that's what I find so frustrating about it. I can't even say that it's a testament to how far games have come in narrative sophistication, because there were games long preceding Oblivion that are more narratively coherent, and there's been a long list of games in the years since that still failed to develop compelling stories. Oblivion is still fun, it's a cozy, recognizable universe that gets a little darker the more you look at it. There may be no utopia here, but there is joy. For many players, Oblivion was their first RPG, and a moment to fall in love with an ambitious, developing genre. It's an engaging game that invites nostalgia like no other, in part because it's depicting an empire that's so drunk on its own. It's a bright and interactive land that you'll want to come back to but it's just hard to ignore that its magic fades the longer you stay. I mean, look at what I've accomplished. Do you see him? Do you think a depressed person could make this? No.